Good morning. Might I, might I have your attention? The, uh, the hour is upon us. Uh, at this time, I would uh, like to invite, invite the uh, scouts to come forward for the presentation of the colors and uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Color guard, attention. Please rise. Well, I was asked to lead everyone singing along together in the singing of the national anthem. So, no? <laughs> so, please join in with me. Hopefully it's in a fitting key for everyone. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched was so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave. Oh, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. you may be seated. Good morning, and uh, I welcome you to what I believe to be the 277th town meeting of the town of Johnson. I suspect that uh, shortly after the town was chartered 277 years ago, there are probably two or three guys got together in a tavern and had the first town meeting. I probably gathered together to try to figure out what to do with uh, 45 and a little bit uh, square miles, uh, which constitutes the town of Johnson. And uh, we meet this morning in that spirit to try to figure out and determine what uh, we're going to do with that same 45 square miles uh, for the coming year. 
I'd like to start by talking to you briefly about the rules of town meeting and I, I must say that uh, this is a very nice turnout we have and I actually am seeing some faces that uh, I don't see every year for the 30 years I've been looking out over your faces and you for those who have been here the whole 30 years you look exactly the same as you did <laughs> when we first got started um, first uh, we are recorded and uh, the way that we keep track of uh, what's going on here is notes are taken but uh, possibly more importantly there's a tape record of of what we're doing and in order for that to work uh, I'm going to be asking people to actually speak to a, a microphone when they speak uh, there's one in the middle of the floor a lot of people who have been there are very familiar with it and have used it often some people are more reluctant to uh, stand up in front of people and for those who are a bit more modest uh, we actually have two young people here today who are going to uh, carry a portable mic and so if you'd like to speak from where you're uh, you're seated uh, I'd ask you to stand, but we'll provide you with a, a, a hand mic so that you don't have to come up into the center of the, uh, the meeting here. Also, when you speak, I would like you to uh, indicate your name because the, although you know, I may recognize you and others may recognize you, the, the tape does not recognize you unless you say who you are. Uh, and so that will probably, if you're gonna speak multiple times, it's gonna require you to identify yourself to the tape multiple times. Uh, insofar as the, the, the famous people in the back, I, I noticed that most of the people in the back have moved forward per my request. We got a few holdouts, but uh, by and large, I'm going to be calling on, on folks that are inside the tape. So if you, if you want to speak, please come forward. Uh, a good hint from the uh, chair of the select board is, uh, is there anyone who has not checked in coming through the checklist? Number two, seeing none. Uh, is, okay. <laughs> good idea. Uh, <clears throat> are there any people here who are not on our checklist? Okay, I have one person. Everyone else is on the checklist? Okay, two. I've got two. <clears throat> and since I got to sing with you, I'll remember you. And uh, the, for the principal of the school here, Mr. Manning, uh, I, I know him as well. And I think I'll, I would notice it if they tried to sneak in a vote somewhere that they weren't entitled to make. Oh, and one in, that's wrong. Okay, I have three. The, uh, the, the process by which we operate, and most of you are familiar with this, but probably a few of you are not. Uh, we operate under Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, it's a fairly thick, densely wrought text uh, with lots of confusing material in there. But the, uh, the bare bones of it are as follows. Uh, in order for us to do anything, um, we have to first have somebody make a motion with regard to the various articles here on, on the warning. Somebody has to second that. Uh, once it's, the motion is made and seconded, the floor is opened up to discussion. Um, it is possible during the course of that discussion that someone may wish to amend um, the main motion, if 
they do, they would stand. They say, I propose an amendment as follows. That requires a second. Discussion follows that. It is possible to have an amendment of an amendment, which is a Byzantine process, which I have to explain and then ask all of you whether you understand what I said. And all of you nod. <laughs> and about half of you are telling the truth. But I really would like you all to tell the truth because it's important on some, on some of these motions when you get amendments and amendments to amendments that, that what you're actually voting on when I call for a vote is something that you understand. So it's important to me and it's important to all of us that uh, you, if you don't understand that uh, you get your hand up and let me explain it. Um, I have been uh, I have been asked to uh, <clears throat> the Johnson Historical Society has requested, and I'm happy to pass this on. Uh, Amy Thompson, uh, a long time uh, resident of Johnson, is uh, going to turn 99 years young on March the 13th, and uh, it has been suggested, and I think wisely that uh, some of us might send greetings to her. Uh, I have an address, uh, but uh, probably the simplest way to deal with that is if you are inclined to send Amy 99th birthday greetings, uh, if you go to the Historical Society uh, table, which is I think in the back right here, hands are waving back there, uh, they will give you the address and you can send something on to her. And unless someone <clears throat> has some other suggestions, uh, I would uh, now engage on the <clears throat> project of reading uh, the warning to you, as is traditional. This is the warning of the Town of Johnson Annual Town Meeting, March 5th, 2019. Voters of the Town of Johnson are hereby notified and warned to meet at the Johnson Elementary School <clears throat> Library on Tuesday, March 5th, 2019, to vote by Australian ballot for the election of the town and Lamoille North Unified Union School District officers, Articles 1 through 4, beginning at 9 o'clock in the morning and continuing until 7 o'clock in the evening uh, on the following. Article 1, to elect a moderator for the town meeting. Article 2, to elect two select board members, one for a three-year term, one for a two-year term. Article 3, to elect one Lamoille North Modified Union, excuse me, Unified Union School Board District. I'm going to do that again. Elect one <clears throat> Lamoille North Modified Unified Union School District Board of Directors for a three-year term. And Article 4, to elect all other town officers as required by law. <clears throat> Moving on to the annual town meeting, the legal voters of the town of Johnson are hereby warned and notified to meet in the Johnson Elementary School gymnasium in said town on March 5, 2019 at 9 a.m. to transact the following business from the floor. Article 5, to review the reports of the town officers and uh, others in <clears throat> included in the town annual report. Article 6, to establish the rates of compensation for the town officers. Article 7, shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $2,709,614.02, of which $1,819,504.74 shall be raised by taxes and $885,109.28 by non-tax revenues. <clears throat> Article 8, shall the town of Johnson raise an additional $45,000 to be used for total compensation of a recreation coordinator to administrator municipal, to, to administer, should be, municipal recreation activities. <clears throat> Article 9, shall the town vote to collect property taxes to the town treasurer in four equal installments per 32 VSA 
4792 as listed below with delinquent taxes and assessments have charged against them an 8% commission after the fourth installment per 32 VSA 1674 and interest charges of 1% per month for a fraction thereof for the first three months and thereafter 1.5% per month or a fraction thereof <clears throat> from the due date of such tax. Such interest shall be imposed on a fraction of a month as if it were the entire month, 32 VSA 5136. <clears throat> Payments are due in the hands of the treasurer by 4 p.m. on the below due dates. First installment to be paid on or before Monday, August 12th, 2019. Second installment to be paid on or before Tuesday, November 12th, 2019. Third installment to be paid on or before Monday, February 10th, 2020. And the fourth installment to be paid on or before Monday, May 11th, 2020. Article 10, will the <clears throat> voters of the town vote to exempt the Masonic Temple uh, from the municipal town taxes for a period of five years? Article 11, shall the town establish a reserve fund to be called the Skate Park Reserve Fund? for the purposes of funding the operation and expand, expansion of the state skate park to be funded <clears throat> by unspent funds annually allocated to the skate park in accordance with 24 VSA 2804. Following articles are advisory only and non-binding. Article 12, shall the voters advise the select board of the town of Johnson to change the inclusivity statement to read, colon, quote, people of Johnston embrace inclusiveness and together <clears throat> we will build bridges to understanding ensuring that all who live work and visit our town feel welcome and safe the things we embrace are kindness gentleness understanding neighborliness peace tolerance and respect for and toward all together we can have a cooperative sustainable and thriving community where everyone is honored and valued Article 13, shall the voters of the town hear a report from the Johnson representatives uh, on the Lamoille North School District. Article 14, to transact such other business as may be properly brought before this town meeting dated uh, January 30th, 2019. Uh, that being said, I will declare that the polls are open for receipt of ballots for Articles 1 through 4 and proceed to Article 5 to review the reports of the town officers and others as included in the town annual report. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I want to start this off on a, a little sad note. Last week, the uh, former chairman of the select board, as well as a longtime member of the select board, passed away, Jim Gillen. So I just ask that we uh, join in a moment of silence in Jim's memory. Thank you. On a much happier note, uh, this is probably one of the best jobs I have is when I'm able to acknowledge and recognize people that are, have done community contributions. Uh, this year, the, the town report dedication is to a woman, Mary Sladek, who has served the community for a number of years. She uh, was a retired school teacher from Lamoille. She served as a library trustee for 16 years. And how most of us probably would recognize her service is as a 32-year JP. Um, part of the job of the JPs is not only in ensuring the integrity of the elections, whether it's in the polling, in the voting, counting the ballots, that sort of thing. It's also serving on the uh, uh, Board of Civil Authority, which is a, the BCA. The select board also serves on that BCA. Uh, the BCA hears all uh, tax appeals and that sort of thing. And uh, there was one JP that we could always depend on to be at every single meeting, always available to do the counting of ballots, and that was Mary. I have 
when we hear those appeals on tax uh, property taxes one of the requirements is we have to go out and view the property I have walked more boundary property lines with with Mary than with any other JP her dedication and service is just second to none uh, JP's are the only officers in the town that are elected by a party affiliation all other select board trustees or um, town clerks etc there's no party affiliation the JP's are the exception we have a balanced uh, uh, of slate of JP's we have uh, currently six uh, Democrats and six Republicans Mary who's been a lifelong Democrat is one of those JP's that everybody wants to work with because everybody loves her she's a, a just a great joy to work with a number of years ago I ran for representative quite unsuccessfully as a Republican I went to Mary's house and uh, I didn't get her vote but I got her hug and uh, I don't even know if she ever voted for me for select board <laughs> but at the end of the day I would a lot rather have Mary's hug than her vote anyways with that I'm gonna ask the uh, Boy Scouts to escort Mary to the front and we're gonna present her with a town report so please join me in in a round of applause to recognize Mary Sladek for her community service found out a little funny story with Mary when she gets a town report she starts at the back and she works forward that's where all the vital uh, statistics were births deaths uh, non uh, the tax delinquent payers and she works forward so she never even knew it was dedicated to her until she got all the way to the end of the book <laughs> who goes to the back and starts at the back but we also wanted to uh, make a recommendation to a couple who have been serving this community in numerous ways over many decades. Uh, one of the members has been the town's only energy uh, coordinator since its inception way back in the 70s. Uh, served on the select board. His wife was a long time, long time member of the school board. Uh, chair for the, for the school board for many of those years. They were instrumental, particularly uh, Casey, in starting the skateboard park. And uh, it's been their efforts that have made it continue. If it wasn't for them, there would not have been a skateboard park, and there wouldn't still be one very active today. They were also recognized last year by the LCPC with the Lifetime Achievement Award. They're, they just, they're like the, uh, was it the ever-ready bunny that just keeps on going? They're the Romeros, uh, Casey and, and uh, Howard Romero. In recognition of their contributions to the community, the loop road that goes around 
in where the trail park used to be, where the uh, skateboard park is now, has been renamed. And we have the sign here. Congratulations, <laughs> and thank you for your service. Uh, also just wanted to uh, make mention of a couple of milestones. As I just got passed, <laughs> another longtime employee of the town, uh, and we certainly want to recognize her. She just came through the door for this recognition. Jan Perkins and her 30 years of service to the town, congratulations. I would also be remiss if I didn't recognize someone else that uh, this marks her 20th anniversary of being elevated to the office of town clerk. And I know that because her and I got elevated at the same time. This is my 20th anniversary as chair. And when we first began, she was brand new town clerk. I was a brand new chair. We had no clue what we were doing. Uh, <laughs> But over the years, she's learned it, and she keeps me on track. With that, please recognize Rosemary Audubon. <laughs> Did you want to say anything? No. <laughs> uh, and lastly, I did want to recognize someone else. He started off the meeting talking about when Johnson was formed, and some people might have wondered if he hadn't always been the moderator, but believe it or not, he has not. Uh, this is his 30th anniversary. Please recognize Dave Williams. interesting lead-in to Article 6 to establish the rates of compensation for town officers. <laughs> it's my understanding that the, uh, the town officers who are compensated are the members of the select board, and at the present time, uh, the, the mere mortal members receive $1,000 per year, and the lauded chairman uh, receives $1,200 a year. Uh, with that information in mind, is there a motion with regard to Article 6? Okay. Um, <clears throat> that the rates of compensation be 1000 for the regular board members and 1200 for the chair, correct? That is the motion. There is a second. There is a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, um, all those in favor of uh, the motion to establish rates of compensation as $1,000 for the regular board members, 1200 for the chair, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Uh, the ayes have it, and uh, the motion is carried. Article 7, shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $2,709,614.02, of which $1,819,504.74 shall be raised by taxes, and $885,109.28 by non-tax revenues. Is there a motion with regard to Article 7? Um, Article is moved as written. Is there a second? second? There is a second. And I'll recognize the board chair. A couple of things. First, uh, one thing that was uh, neglected in the town report uh, 
oversight that didn't get included was a summary page. That was something that was requested oh, some number of years ago by the voters, and we have included it. Uh, it was not purposeful, but somehow we did forget to get that into the town report. It, there is one of the handouts in front of you that has that summary page. Uh, we would appreciate some feedback. Is it something you see value in it? Uh, if you do, we would certainly put it in again next year. If you don't see value in it, then we wouldn't. Very basically, the way the budget is built is we go through and what do we need for a budget for expenditures to support the town for the next year. We build that. If that's $100 for a budget, we have a lot of revenue that comes in of other sources from fees for you know, everything from hunting licenses to uh, funding from federal and state grants to the, what's raised by taxes. If, if the fees and, and uh, other revenue come in and it's $48, then that means we have to raise $52 to match the 100 from, uh, from property taxes. So that's how we build our budget, very, you know, 30,000 foot basically. Whatever we have for expenses, we gotta match it with revenue. Whatever we don't have for other resources, uh, sources of revenue, such as state and federal funding, has gotta be made up by the uh, t property taxes. The reason I mention all of this, if you go to uh, page 14 in the budget, line five, current taxes, the amount to be raised by property taxes is $1,819,505. There is a fairly significant amount that, over what we had budgeted last year of about 180000 which is a, comes out to be about eight and a half cents on your tax rate. I'll get into the, where that is later on, but uh, if we go down through the rest of the revenue side of this budget, everything is pretty much in line with previous years. It's, you know, it's a plus or minus a few dollars, but it's pretty much in line. If you skip all the way down to page 17, where we have the line 115, that's the total revenue, less property taxes. You'll see the the total revenue is 885000 which is very close to what it was last year, 886000 Where the big impactor in this year's tax rate is the very next line, 116. Last year, we were able to have estimated cash on hand of 138000 to apply towards reducing taxes. This year, we're estimating we're gonna have $5,000. So that's about six cents right there of your tax rate increase is what we're not gonna have at the end of the year for this current fiscal budget. A uh, couple of for driving forces there. One is, it's a direction we've been working at for years is trying to tighten the budget, tighten the amount that we estimate for revenue and tighten the amount that we estimate the cost for uh, budget is going to be. Uh, by tightening that every single year, we've been narrowing it down to where the intent is there will be no extra money collected so there would be no extra cash on hand to return to reducing taxes. The other driving factor is uh, the current winter we're in. When we were building this budget, we had come, winter had really started in early November and every week and every weekend it snows and we are we were at that time had spent our whole sand and salt budget our estimate for the end of the year is basically doubling it so that is a huge driver of why we're anticipating no cash on hand virtually no cash on hand at the end of this current fiscal budget to be able to apply for next year so those two driving factors are the big impacts uh, and if you follow it down for the, the total to be raised by taxes, uh, 
is the eight and a half cents, which is the one million eight eight hundred thousand nineteen eight hundred nineteen thousand five hundred five dollars for a total revenue of two million seven hundred and nine thousand six hundred fourteen dollars, which is in line with the budget. There, the budget as it's being presented, it's a responsible budget. We are there are no new initiatives. It's uh, basically doing what we need to to support the statutory requirements as well as what has been deemed as priorities by the, the community in years past. So I'll go down through the budget and just identify a few things that uh, maybe are, should be of note. If you go to the bottom of page 17, one, line 147, that's the Development Review Board expense. This is a new line item. Uh, this is out of the form-based code that we implemented a year ago. We expect that should, uh, will be full force this summer. There may be some development. There's a placeholder of 500 in there. We really don't know what expenses there might be. We don't anticipate a lot, but we did put a, a placeholder of $500 in there. So that is a new line item. As we get into this a few years down the road, we'll probably have a much better feel for does, is it gonna cost us much and what is it gonna cost us? If you continue on down to page 19, line 192, is a conservation reserve fund. This is a new line item. This was a reserve fund that, that you, the voters established last year. We've put some seed money in there as well of $250. And that 250 is something we took out of a line, a few lines above it, 187, which is the conservation, uh, conservation Commission's expense line item. They originally had $1,500 and they were willing to uh, knock that down $250 and put that as a, a little seed money into their reserve fund. Continuing on to the next page, 20, line 238, that's public safety. Uh, there are some significant increases here. This is mostly beyond our control. It is a major uh, cost or part of our budget. It's about a little under 28% of our budget is on public safety. Uh, line 241, which is NEMS, the Emergency Medical Services, they're seeing about $11,000 increase. A lot of that was driven by uh, less reimbursement from the feds on their transports of Medicaid patients, as well as uh, retaining uh, their EMTs. They're, they're getting very uh, cost competitive, and as you may have read, there's a shortage of EMTs in the state, and they're, they're stealing from each other. So Burlington is stealing them from us, and, and so their salaries have got to be more competitive. Line 242 is the law, law enforcement patrol. Uh, they're, they're about a $29,000 increase. A lot of the same factors with theirs as well. They're always competing with salaries, trying to stay competitive, as well as uh, their normal expenses that have been increasing. Um, line 243, this is dispatch services, communications. This is uh, level funded this year, so that was good. Uh, Roger worked very hard at that, but some of the driver for why it was able to be level funded was some retirement of some of the higher paid salaries. Moving on to page 23. The beginning of the highway, th line 323. You'll notice line 327 and line 328 are, are blank. That was a mistake in when it went out to the printers. Basically, from line 332 should be pushed up two lines. So the, the 21,000 should be under Social Security. The 16,000 should be under retirement. Uh, the 139 would be under un unemployment, and the 56,000 would be under insurance. And the, the class four road labor and non-highway projects were the ones that should have been zeroed out with no, no budgeted amounts. 
moving on to the next page, line 20, or page 24, line 356. That is a new line item, mud abatement. This money had previously been in line 351, which was a construction projects annual budget. We, because this is an ongoing annual thing that we are working at, we just decided that we should pull it out and identify how much money is going into mud abatement. So that, the uh, line 352 construction projects annual got reduced from last year's line item budgeted of 41,000 down to 15,000 and then 15,000 of that is down on line 356 as part of the mud abatement. And then basically moving all the way down to the end of page 25 is the budget. It's two, $2 million, $709,604. That is a 3.6% increase. If you backed out the, uh, the Jewett property that was approved last year, the purchase of it, it would have been a 2% increase which we felt was uh, you know, pretty much in line with the rate of inflation. So that's, that's about the highlights of it. Okay. You just recognize them? Thank you, Yarek. Um, I have a concern about the uh, Duncan Hastings, sorry. I have a concern about the wording of Article 7. Um, the wording says um, 1,819,504.74 shall be raised by taxes. I think that binds the board to raise that amount of money in taxes, and I don't think that's what you want. Um, you've done a good job of explaining the fact that the, the question of how much money is going to be left over at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. This budget predicts $5,000, but you won't actually know how much money is left over until after June 30th of this year. This budget is built six years, uh, six months in advance of what your actual knowledge is of the financial situation of the town on June 30th. So this says shall be raised. So I believe that commits you, regardless of how much money you actually end up with, um, with how much money actually ends up coming into the coffers, how much you've actually expended, commits you to raise that amount of money in taxes. And I don't think that's what you want. So I'm going to propose an amendment to the main article, striking the words shall be and replacing them with is estimated to be raised by taxes. That gives the board the ability to set a tax rate based on known dollar amounts at that time. I also wanted to make one other comment about the budget itself. I don't know if it's appropriate to get a second first or make the comment. Right, let's, let's get a second. Is there a second? There is a second. Thank you. The only other comment I wanted to make about, about the budget is line 272, um, recreation coordinator salary. Uh, last year there was $8,200 in the budget. This year there's nothing in the budget. And this is apropos of a motion of an article that's coming after this uh, about the recreation coordinator establishment of that position. I just want everyone to be clear that if this budget passes and the article fails, there's no money in the budget for a recreation coordinator position. Am I correct on that? Yes. Okay. Okay, just. Uh, <clears throat> There's been a motion to amend, that's been seconded. So the discussion at this point is limited to 
the motion to amend. And not to the general budget, which we will get to in its turn. Is there any further discussion or is there a discussion on the motion to amend, which proposes to change the language uh, shall be to is estimated to be? Uh, the, the question was, uh, is, is there, what was the language used in previous years? I'm not, sh I may have last year's town report with me, but I'm not sure. Any? Yeah, in previous years, off the top of my head, I don't remember, but I know that this motion has changed over the years in different formats. Um, we may have sometimes not identified how much was to be raised as taxes, but only uh, identified what the budget number is. So I, I can't answer that exactly. Eric, to, to the book on page 78. Okay, you, you found it? Article 7, page 78. <laughs> Okay, so last year it was identified that way. With what way? Uh, with the amount to be raised by taxes as part of the motion. Um, to address what Duncan brought up about the uh, having a better handle on how much money we would need to raise, yes, we're, we're near the end of our uh, fiscal year of June 30th, However, we have to set the tax rate within the first week of July, and we, Rosemary has not uh, uh, totally wrapped up the books yet. So we usually don't know exactly what we have for money left over until August time frame, usually. Uh, but we might have a better handle, you're right. Um, I don't have an issue with your change. I think it's probably very appropriate. There has been a motion to call a question with regard to the motion to amend. Uh, is there a second to that calling question? There is a second. That means that uh, this concludes the discussion with regard to the amendment. We proceed directly to a vote on that motion. And the motion was to change the language of the original motion, uh, which in the second line said, of which $1,819,504.74 shall be raised by taxes, striking shall be and substituting therefore is estimated to be. So if you vote yes on the vote I'm about to call for, you agree that the uh, is estimated to be language should be, substituted for the, should be substituted for the shall be language. Yes? Are we supposed to vote on calling the question first? That's, it's, it's changing the, he's calling the question, he's calling the question on the amendment. So we're now gonna vote on the amendment. Okay, I, I, I get you, I get you. I, I got ahead of myself, a half a motion, excuse me. All those in favor of calling the question and then proceeding to the vote on the motion to amend. All those in favor of calling the question signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. And, and we're proceeding then to a vote on the amendment which I just previously explained to you. Is there any question, now that I've created it, uh, <clears throat> any question on what we're now voting on, which is the substitution of, is estimated to be for the phrase, shall be? Yes?
That's correct. We're voting on the amendment. Any confusion? Okay. All in favor of the <clears throat> motion to amend, which would substitute is estimated to be for the phrase shall be signified by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Ayes have it, and uh, the amendment has passed. That brings us now back to the main budget uh, discussion, and we're going to have to, could you get a microphone over here, please? So I, I have a quick question about the Jewett property. Um, and Eric, you just, and this is Scott Meyer, by the way. Um, you had just mentioned that it's a 1% increase on the total budget. And there was a lot of conversation last year on the Jewett property, on the benefits and negatives. But in this year's town report, there's no mention of where we are. So I would love to hear where we are and the money that was spent, where it went to. The, the, the increase in our budget is for the note to uh, pay for the Jewett property. The Jewett property was uh, purchased, I don't know, June-ish time frame or something, May? May or June last spring, we purchased after the voters had approved the, uh, the article. Uh, we purchased the Jewett property. What you're seeing for the increase is what the added, the cost of the note is for the principal and the interest. I guess Eric, what I'm looking for yeah. is how we got where with moving it forward. Okay, uh, yes. We have, going, going forward, uh, we were denied the first uh, round of uh, grant application to develop the site. Uh, that's our, our course of action, is trying to get one of these grants because we don't want to put that on the taxpayers to develop it. Um, we're currently in the process of going for the second round, and probably Brian can talk a little more to this, but uh, that's our, where we are right now. So nothing, no ground has been you know, dug into or movement in that direction yet. Um, so does that supplement uh, line 234, which is the light industrial park line item? Identify. For 39th, uh, sorry, Beth Foy. Um, thanks, David. Um, does that supplement the $39,000 on line 234 if we get a grant? No. If, if we got a grant, it would pay, and the light industrial park is a Jewett property for, we sort of refer to it in both ways. Uh, the, Line 234, the light industrial park, is the amount of principal that's being paid on the note. If we get a grant, that would be to develop the site. Eric Noose. Uh, I'm wondering, last year at town meeting, there was a motion on the floor that passed to cut the overall budget by, I believe, about $30,000. And I'm wondering if you could explain how uh, the town dealt with that over the last year, and if that has any impact on the uh, uh, surplus uh, or leftover monies that we don't have very much of, apparently, right now. As far as impact, no, that did not. Where those cuts were, if you go to page 37, as part of the select board's report, uh, they've all been identified. The bulk of it came out of uh, mud abatement and paving, which is part of the highway department, and then down through from there. It was quite a number of things that we uh, made some small cuts to, to add up to 30,000. Hi, Sally Cole. Good question, Eric. I just have a question regarding last year. I believe we voted 
to not create another highway department position? Am I correct on that? We, we didn't say no to that proposal. I thought that was part of the actual funds that Eric was just talking about. The, uh, that was built into our budget as establishing a fifth employee. Um, that was one thing the select board could have deemed appropriate to eliminate. Uh, however, with the requirements that are getting put on us from the state for the stormwater runoff and, and just the workload that's being increased, that was not where the select board chose to make its cuts. Okay, so this actual increase in the highway budget from 198000 to 240000 and it falls under salaries, is that the actual position that we voted no on? Did we get it? Did, did they actually hire another person? We did hire another person, yes. They're so, currently on board. So our vote of no, the what vote, does that say? The, I, I guess that's my question. What does that say about town meeting? The motion that was made and approved by the voters was that 30000 be cut from the, the total budget and the choice was left up to the select board. And that's... Okay, the, so the select board just chose to kind of override the vote of the town. No, we had to abide by the vote of the town. The direction from the town was that we decide where to make the cuts. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kyle Archer. Um, in the handout for the budget summary, uh, on line 237, or no, excuse yeah, 237, the percentage change is 99.5% increase from, from last year. I was just wondering w what that outlier was. As that's a summary, I'm going to have to go to the, uh, yeah, go into the book to see where, what the increase was, main driver there. <coughs> So probably the biggest, one of the biggest drivers there was line 234, which is the light industrial park uh, principal payment of, well, just 39,000, close to 40,000. That's probably the biggest impact to that category. You have a microphone coming your way. Kim Dunkley, and I'm just looking at the last two years, um, $45,593 increase, and that's for our policing part law enforcement. And I'm just wondering if the town has ever looked into what it would cost if we had our own little whatever even if it was one person who was responsible for Johnson and if that amount which is over four hundred thousand four hundred and sixty thousand dollars if that money could actually be cut by having someone who is responsible solely for Johnson and who um, we paid possibly less money to I don't know if it's ever been looked at it has in the past uh, it may not have been recently However, uh, I will note that the, the sheriff is very aware of this increase that, that's happening in the patrol. Uh, he's very sensitive to it. He, he doesn't have the answers, and what he's going to be looking for is a uh, committee of, of concerned citizens from all three towns, patrol towns, uh, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Wolcott and to look at that and look at different options. Maybe we won't have 24 hour service. Maybe we'll do away with the detective position. I mean, there are, there are a lot of things that we could do. It's gonna, if we reduce it, it's probably gonna be some impact of service. But that is something that going forward is gonna be looked at. And 
I will defer to Nat if you've got anything you wanted to add. Okay. Just a second. You want to go over here? You can recognize you want to stand up. So, Scott Meyer again. So, on the sheriff's contract, um, I'm a village trustee, so I get to see the ratio of warnings versus tickets for speeders in this community. And it's always been sort of 50 50. And we had a meeting last year with Roger and his deputies, which was awesome. And this came up, trying to be a walkable community um, and having streets in Johnson, Clay Hill, one that I live on, so I'm a little bit biased on that, and Railroad Street. We have people in this community and visiting who speed recklessly through this town. I have asked in the past to fix that, where if you're speeding, you get a ticket not a warning. And I've also provided examples of other communities <coughs> throughout Vermont where people know if you speed through their community, you're going to get a ticket. So your behavior has changed. And I'm not seeing a huge, any kind of change in speeding in this community. And you know, there's little kids, there's adults, there's older folks who are trying to walk through the town and you know, Clay Hill and Railroad Street is frightening to walk on. And we went through this discussion last year with that separate meeting, and I'm wondering, has anything changed? We're paying over $400,000 a year for a service that I feel is falling flat. We don't have to hire our own patroller. We have well-educated, well-trained police department from the sheriff's department. Why aren't they giving more tickets to really start focusing on getting the speeders to lighten off their gas pedal. You know, and for folks in town who do speed, your time that you're trying to save is not worth a life. Jeff Bickford, uh, you stated that we don't really have any control over the amount on that line item, um, and can you clarify that for the sheriff's department? Yeah, just to be um, clear. I'll probably defer to Nat because he's our uh, liaison with the sheriff's department. But uh, you know, a lot of it's built in costs, the insurance, the salaries, the bulk of their costs, their budget is salaries, oh, yeah. and to some degree their vehicles. Uh, those are built-in costs uh, to stay competitive and not continually losing our patrol officers, uh, having the turnover. It's something we're dealing with constantly. We, uh, we pay this community and, and the other two, Hyde Park and Wolcott, to send officers out for training, get, pay for all of that upfront investment, make that investment, and then they leave for greener pastures, state police, Morrisville, Stowe. Um, but I'll, I'll defer to Nat. I, uh, Nat Kinney, uh, I, I winced when Eric said we don't have control over that line item because I, well, I feel like uh, so it is a, it's a difficult one to control. Um, but we do, um, the three towns that enter into the contract, Johnson, um, Hyde Park, and Wolcott, um, along with the sheriff, um, the three the three towns have representatives to um, the uh, Chair's Budget Advisory Committee, and that committee, I'm a member, Brian's a member, um, meets regularly through the year to um, um, look at the Chair's Budget and to see what the drivers are, to see what's going on with the Chair's Budget, and, and to try and influence it where we can. Um, and in terms of um, moving forward, I think Eric, Eric's point is really important that um, we really need to, in the, in the next few weeks, uh, move forward on Roger Marcoux's suggestion that we um, create a sort of a summer committee, a summer study committee on um, law enforcement in the three towns and look what um, our potential options are, whether it's you know, uh, hiring 
our own force, which I think would be prohibitively expensive personally, but it should be looked at, whether it's hiring, uh, contracting with um, state police, as other towns do, um, whether it's reducing coverage. Um, we, we, we do have influence in those ways. Should we want to reduce our coverage in some way or look at options? And we need to be doing that. So, and I apologize, I guess the part B of my question or the rest of it would be, um, so I'm seeing, uh, you know, salary increase proposed that is um, higher than uh, inflation and higher than what the town itself has said we need to increase on salary. And I understand retention is an issue, but there are also several equipment uh, expenses that are fairly substantial. Um, is there room to, is the contract such that, uh, that it's possible to make a motion to amend the amount that we um, allocate to the sheriff's department or are we locked into that amount uh, as listed yeah we're, listed. we're pretty much locked in right now because it is a uh, and that's the same thing with NIMS as well NIMS is with five towns it's sort of a when it gets to this stage it's a take it or leave it type of proposition you can we could vote it down but we cannot really adjust it because any adjustment that would be made for Johnson would have to be made across the other communities as well thank you for your clarification John Gregg. I'm just curious about Scott's point about speeding and whether legally, in conjunction with the Sheriff's Department, there's an entrepreneurial way where the town of Johnson, either through the Sheriff's Department or on its own, could hire a retired policeman and fund the car and let's just, for the sake of argument, say that's 100000 a year. That's six, I, I, I don't know what tickets are, but if they were $50 a, t a ticket, that's six tickets a day. And I'm wondering if there's any way that could be looked at separately just for the select board to address the issue of pedestrian safety, community walkability through a way that doesn't necessarily connect to the other two towns doesn't involve the whole issue of law enforcement. And just, I know in Danville, everybody knows that Danville's a speed, speed trap. And they have, it might be four hours a day when, you know, because I'm sure, Scott, from your figures, you know, or there are statistics as to when most of the speeding happens. And I'm wondering if we could just address that on our own and pay for the cost of traffic, I mean, the whole Main Street project started off as a traffic calming project. And, you know, uh, at the time I had proposed hiring a sharpshooter to sit up in the Masonic Tower Temple and shoot out people's tires, but that was considered it might be have insurance issues. But I think there's probably a way, and it could be probably fairly quickly determined whether we could self-fund the slowing of traffic in town. It's an interesting thing to look at, not the sharpshooter, but uh, <laughs> our own force. Uh, and just one other thing, Kim. Uh, about 50 years ago, Rocky Hooper was the police force in town. the first and only police chief we ever had. Uh, it, it's something that really should be charged with that committee that's gonna be formed on looking at all these different options. Uh, it might not be the best place to decide it right here today, but have that committee really dig into, would we want some level of our own police force uh, you know, with that added cost? John, that was not on the record. <laughs> Correct. Hang on, just just a second. Sure. 
Offy, go ahead. I don't know if it's part of the uh, traffic. Identi identify yourself to the record. Oh, Offy please. wore them. Uh, so talking about the streets, I don't know if it's part of the traffic control or what, but the uh, holes, potholes in the road that we have here, traffic control, uh, is it um, a problem with the budget? To, uh, we can't come up with enough money to just cover some of these holes a little bit? That's okay. I'm guessing you're referring to uh, the state highways, Route 15 particularly? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I can very happily stand here and say that's a state, state issue and the town has nothing to do with it. Uh, but I do know that the state, is, the town is dealing with some of it on a lesser degree that the state is this particular winter with the, the snow and then we get rain and then it goes deep freeze and the water gets into the pavement and freezes and pops it up and they fill the pothole and the next snowstorm that comes along, it plows the, the uh, stay mat right out. Uh, it, it's become a huge, huge issue and it's not just here in Johnson, it's all over the state, but it's recognized. Robin Story. Um, so I just, uh, to the point of the speeders, uh, I've kind of always joked that we shouldn't have signs as you come in and out of town saying, uh, drive like your children live here because people really don't care about other people's kids for the most part. But we could have a sign that says, drive like you don't want us to put in a speed table. <laughs> so um, I know that that's not legal, but whatever. It's I still think it's a good idea. Um, so as far as making the village more walkable, and I say this as somebody who you've probably seen me schlep up and down um, Main Street quite a few times and schlep up and down Clay Hill for that matter. I think that the most thing we can do is not necessarily worry about speeders is we need sidewalks and that's the village. Um, so if you're concerned as I am about um, the uh, walkability of the town then I would you know ur urge everybody that you know your village trustees should be out there trying to improve the sidewalk infrastructure. I think it's kind of a shame that people, there's no sidewalk leading up to the library. Um, so you have to cross the street to get to the library. So it would be really nice to see better sidewalk infrastructure. I think that that is the most important thing that we would get for making this village more walkable. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm concerned about speeding as well, but uh, you know, having to cross the street to get to a sidewalk, I think is, is what puts me in the most danger, so. Mary Sladek, I would like to, two things. Number one, to recognize the fact that Rocky Hooper was a very good policeman and did a very good job, but it was in the 70s. This is not the 70s, and I think we have to deal with problems from 2019 and on. One man can't do it, and I do like John John's uh, proposal that we investigate having a retired policeman policing Railroad Street and some of the side streets that are heavily used. I think people tend to slow down on Main Street, but they don't when nobody's looking at them. And I'm one of those people that crosses Railroad Street in a very slow way. Thank you. No, no, it's, it's not, okay. With all, with all due respect, No, I want to get back to the pothole thing. <laughs> Just quickly, though. Uh, I thought this was the year that the state is coming from Morrisville now through Johnson to repair our highway. Is, aren't we on their docket for this year? There Thank is you. a handout from the legislators somewhere going around this room, and it identifies the year and what highways in our area are going to be taken care of. Uh, John Levitt. Uh, my question is, as to the uh, Sheriff's Department, how do we know we're getting what we're paying for? Um, okay. <laughs> He's going to give me the first shot. Uh, that's really your decision. Uh, it comes out to the community. Do you feel that you're getting what the service that you pay for? We as a select board see a monthly report from the sheriff's office. I know how many tickets were written, uh, how many calls were made to Johnson from everything from uh, vehicle checks to domestic to uh, uh, untimely deaths. I, I and the select board see that every month. Um, I believe we're getting our money's worth, but 
let's hear it from you on what you think. Well, the reason I ask that question is because if you make a deal with the state police, for instance, you can hire them to patrol your town and for a certain price they will guarantee you a certain number of hours of patrol. And I was wondering if the Sheriff's Department does that. We do get from the sheriffs in that sheriff's report how much time they spent in Johnson, if they've done any uh, uh, walk patrol, et cetera, that sort of thing. What you would not get from the state police, you would get their set number of hours for patrol. What you would not get is the, you know, if it's uh, 24 hours service you would not get you would not get the uh, response unless they're available and in the area for simple breaking and entry you know nothing really uh, uh, nobody got hurt or anything like that if it's a homicide yes they would respond like they will to anywhere else but they don't have the the manpower to support some of the services that we get from the sheriff's department thank you <clears throat> yeah uh, Kyle Archer um, I, I, I'd like to say that, you know, um, I have a just slight uh, knowledge of the inner workings of the, the state police. Um, I think it's an incredibly practical solution that if yeah, everyone, uh, it seems, is concerned about the uh, Lamoille County Sheriff uh, budget and the numbers with it, it is, uh, uh, we could subcontract out to the state. And um, those, vow those hours are mostly volunteer, though. Um, from the state police uh, officers themselves. They are not, um, y we may get the guaranteed contract hours, but uh, they would be, you know, or we could be fully uh, integrated into their coverage area, um, or we could contract out certain areas. But as was just said, you know, you would not have the 24 hour response uh, or 24 hour uh, service. You would get, you know, a 40 minute response time uh, possibly in an emergency. Um, especially after the hours of 2 a.m. Um, but it is a, mu I, I don't know, but it would seem a very, very practical and less expensive option. Um, but it would be a lesser service as far, I mean, you know, the state's already well funded that we're paying for with our, you know, state taxes. Um, so I, I just wanted to throw it out there that, yeah. Greg Stefanski. Um, Eric, to your question, I guess I, I'd like to state on record that I've been incredibly impressed with the response uh, that the Sheriff's Department provides. Um, our work at Laraway um, uh, has us uh, making calls um, every so often, um, but also on a personal level, whether it's uh, having a wallet taken or things like that. Um, been very impressed with the response. Our, our work at Laraway also means we get to interact with some uh, law enforcement agencies in other communities. And I can tell you that there's, there's no question that the uh, response time is uh, significantly better with the Sheriff's Department and the quality of the response in terms of resolving whatever crisis uh, might come up. I do think one thing that might also be worth looking at is our, uh, the towns of Cambridge, towns of Eden uh, uh, do rely on state police support. Um, there have been conversations about them being a part of a contract with the Sheriff's Department, but uh, to my knowledge, nothing has moved forward there. Um, and I believe that our, the Sheriff's Department does provide some level of support to those towns, even though it's not under contract. Um, so that may mean that to a certain degree, the towns that are in the contract are subsidizing some of the costs to support towns that are not. So it, I think in this discussion with the Sheriff's Department, um, if they collect data on their response to other towns outside the contract, I think that's worth looking at and what that means for those of us who are paying uh, the costs for their salaries and equipment. Thank you. Casey okay. Romero, and addressing uh, are we getting our money's worth, quote unquote, from the Sheriff's Department contract, I can't answer it in terms of money's worth but I can answer in, an, in one instance as are we getting what we need for service and certainly an incident uh, that we had in the skate park this August, the answer is overwhelmingly yes. Uh, we had quite a complicated problem, set of problems involving five, six kids, one adult and a homeless family all at once and we didn't know who had done what, et cetera. 
and uh, they stepped right in. They were responsive in emails to me. We got it. We got things sorted out. Uh, we absolutely got the service that we needed. And I've <clears throat> heard anecdotally from other people over the years of, I was in trouble. I got the help. It was quick. So I, I would say I, I do believe we're getting what we need. Um, so on question of how do we know we're getting what we're paying for, just to be clear on what we're, what we're paying for, um, we get a minimum of one officer on duty um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, full coverage all the time. That officer could be right now up in, well, there are a number of officers working on town meeting day, obviously, but um, that one person on patrol could be up at the end of North Wolcott Road and in uh, Wilkett, could be down the other end uh, down here in Johnson. Um, but at any given time, they're, they're on the road somewhere. Um, they're providing 911 response. They're doing foot patrols as they're able to through the village. Um, so there's that one officer on duty 24 hours a day. Second thing that we're getting that we voted for um, here in this town meeting uh, four or five years ago is a detective position. Um, and that detective is working full-time investigating sex crimes, burglaries, drug activity, and other serious criminal activity uh, in the county. Um, we don't hear a lot about what the work of the detective is because a lot of it is, um, uh, it has to do with children and, and families and, and people who are very vulnerable and um, for their, um, uh, out of respect to them, that doesn't, what the detective's doing often doesn't get splashed on the front page of the paper. A couple of interesting things happened uh, in the last 12 months. Um, one was we had a, a, a serious flood situation um, in, in Johnson. Um, and for months, we had the, the ice jam, which was a, we had for, well, for weeks, excuse me, a perpetual risk of, of, um, of flooding. The, the sheriff's um, services during that time were really critical for Johnson. And they were critical 24 hours a day for them to be helping to monitor the situation and helping with our um, uh, fire department and other emergency services during that period. And that was um, a, a really great service that we provided. That, and I think that if we went in another, another direction, contracting with state police, we wouldn't have gotten that level of service. The, another example of something that happened, we had, there was a big festival last July. Um, perhaps a lot of you were there. It was uh, the, the big pot legalization festival that happened down on, on Willow Crossing. Um, and there were hundreds or thousands of people that showed up for this, for this festival, um, which is all fine. Everything they were doing was legal. But whenever you have a large group of people having a, a weekend long festival, there are legitimate um, public safety concerns. And, and our sheriff did a really good job of working with the organizers of that, um, of that event to make sure that it happened safely. And if there was anything that went wrong, what's gonna happen? Is there a parking plan? Um, there were extra patrols that weekend um, so that, um, because there was just extra, extra traffic around. So um, there are a lot of these services that we get that you don't necessarily see on a day-to-day -day basis that um, uh, I think are really valuable. So um, I want to keep that in mind. Um, there's another point I wanted to make. I think it was about Route 15. I'm really upset about Route 15. Um, <laughs> I've blown out two tires this year. I've spoken with our, our state legislators and some folks at the AOT. Um, my understanding is that Route 15 between Morris, between here and uh, Wilkett won't be resurfaced until 2021 or 2022. So um, I think that's a really serious issue. Um, I certainly uh, voiced my um, dismay with the state and with our state legislators, but um, make some noise. Yeah. Um, apropos of what you just said, I don't know if we can wait 2021, 20, 2022 for the I roads. Ident identify yourself. Off you were them. Thank you. Uh, when, um, you know, 2021 for a repair of a road. I don't know why the uh, town can't, you know, take it upon itself, maybe once a week, load up a truck with some stuff and 
just repair some holes? Do we have enough money for that in our budget? Or do, are we going to wait for 2021, 22? If only it was that simple. It's the state's right away. We are not authorized to work in there right away. Uh, not only that, but it would, it would come out of our taxpayers' money to support it. Uh, so a couple of things I wanted to address that Greg brought up. Uh, and the Laraway has been a very responsible citizen. They did recognize a few years ago that uh, the sheriff's office was maybe responding and helping them more than their share and they have been ponying up 10,000, 12,000 a year towards a contribution to offset the cost of the patrol budget. So, I mean, they are very responsible citizens. They did recognize they were a, I'm not gonna say burden, but a, uh, a repeat customer of the Sheriff's Department. And uh, they, they did take that extra action and they've been doing that every year for I don't know, five, six, seven years, whatever. The other thing that Greg mentioned was about, you know, responding to Cambridge, uh, Eden, and the Sheriff's Office does do that. It's a mutual aid thing. Uh, we have, if there's a situation here in Johnson, sometimes you probably have seen Morristown police officers or Stowe police officers or state police officers assisting Lamoille and Lamoille does that mutual aid back to them. When it is in Cambridge, it's a life or death situation that Lamoille will respond to a system uh, as well as in Eden or some of the other surrounding towns. It is uh, something that we do monitor and if we see it looking like it is being abused, and this is, I'm going back probably 15 years ago or so, we felt like that the three patrol towns that Eden was getting a uh, you know was abusing the the asset that we are providing for our communities and we did go address it with Eden and the state police had to step up and, and take a greater share of that workload the same thing was happening to Cambridge a few years ago where they were automatically calling Lamoille and Lamoille was getting there before the state police and uh, you know it was not a fair thing to the taxpayers of Johnson, Hyde Park, and Wolcott supplementing Cambridge in police services. So that has been recognized when it gets, and I'm saying abused because they're using us too often and not stepping up to their own responsibilities. A lot of that's been alleviated over the last few years because they have their own state police outpost now in Cambridge. Uh, I'm Greg Tatro. Uh, has the town looked into speed bumps or speed humps on uh, like Railroad Street and maybe uh, School Street, a few of these streets? I don't think you can put them on hills like up Clay Hill because if it's winter it would be hard for uh, people to stop and start. But I would think in some of the heavier foot traffic areas uh, would be a good way to reduce speeds and uh, they work uh, 24 hours a day 365 days a year um, uh, that's a question my comment is on the sheriff department uh, my situation I've been working with them some and uh, they're working hard we're getting our money's worth uh, the detective is uh, swamped there's a lot of crime uh, that people don't hear about here in this uh, town or our communities and uh, they don't have any extra time they're they're working as hard as they can so I fully support the uh, sheriff department in uh, Lamoille County Greg uh, a point you brought up about the speed bumps in years past we have looked into that um, we can check into it again see if things have changed but our insurance carrier recommended against it because there's a certain liability the town would then assume. <coughs> yeah. Wake her up. <laughs> Is it on? Yep. Um, I have the greatest amount of respect for Roger Marku, both as a person and as a professional law enforcement uh, agent for us. 
in 15 years of working with the town, I never had a, a negative experience in working with any of the officers um, from Lamoille. Um, they, they do good work. Roger has overseen a really good department um, and taken it in a, in a good direction, I believe. Um, having said that, um, the budget is, or their budget represents almost 18% of our total budget. Um, it's, it's a lot of money. Nat has pointed out that he doesn't think that we could do that um, as efficiently ourselves. Um, he's, he's probably right. Where I'm going with this is I fully support the idea of establishing a committee, and I strongly believe that committee should be uh, directed by you and the other contract um, towns involved. Um, the other comment is about the contract with the Sheriff's Department. It's really important to understand that um, Roger um, is willing to execute a contract with the town. Um, Roger, like many of us, is approaching retirement age and he won't always be the Sheriff. Um, if someone else is elected, it would be their choice whether or not to execute a contract with the contract towns to, to continue a long-standing process. One can assume that the next sheriff probably would be interested and willing to do that, but it's not a guarantee. Um, our contract is a two-way street. It's the three contract towns plus the sheriff's department. Um, so I, I strongly support the idea of having a, con uh, having a committee. Um, it's time to, to think out of the box a little bit about law enforcement. I think everybody agrees that it's a really important part of a community. Um, but I, I think that there are things that we could do and should do to try and think out of the box and come up with some creative solutions that maybe will cost less money. Thanks. All good points. Um, I'll also, to, brought to mind, yeah, uh, uh, Roger Marku just got reelected re to a four-year term, so um, we assume we're probably pretty good for at least those four years. Um, but yeah, if the next sheriff comes in, doesn't want to renew the contract for whatever reason, um, it's possible that that service goes away. Um, if we were to rely, rely on the state police, I will say that um, from what I'm reading in the newspapers, um, the uh, state police um, patrol contracts, there are people in Montpelier who are um, looking to get rid of um, uh, contracts between municipalities and the, share and the uh, state police. So that state police coverage could also be yanked out from under us if, if we went in that direction. So. Linda Moldy. I have a friend in Burlington who lives in downtown Burlington where the crime rate is somewhat higher than uh, in our rural area, but they got together and formed a neighborhood watch group and there are people, ordinary citizens, not police officers, who go out and patrol and I, I don't know how they coordinate with the police or anything. I don't know exactly what they do, but they keep a watch on their neighborhood and uh, perhaps that would be something to organize here. There has been a motion to call the question. Is there a second? There is a second. All those in favor of calling the question and proceeding to a vote on the uh, motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Ayes have it. And so many people coming and going up here, it's hard to find the original paperwork. Just bear with me, please. <coughs> the motion is um, shall the voters, uh, well, it's, it's a motion to authorize um, total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $2,709,614.02 for 
of which $1,819,504.74 uh, is estimated to be raised by taxes and $885,109.28 by non-tax revenues. All in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Ayes have it, the motion is carried. Now, <clears throat> I believe I have seen wandering about the back a number of uh, legislators who have come to uh, expose themselves to your penetrating questions. <laughs> and I, I would invite all three of them to come forward and meet your constituents. Uh, so I'm Matt Hill uh, from Johnson originally. I now live in Wilkett. Um, and I am on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee for the second term, for my second term. I was on the same committee in the first term. Uh, this year, I think we're gonna be putting a lot of uh, effort and, and time into workforce development initiatives. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, things in front of our plate as far as economic development goes with uh, broadband access and cell access, uh, and things of that nature. Um, so far, it's in my committee, it's been a pretty uh, slow start, only because our bills are very, big and, and uh, all-encompassing, you know, and they're uh, uh, comprehensive bills that are um, not short. Um, and so we've been slugging away through uh, workforce development things and trying to find uh, ways we can skill up people to get jobs. We know that there's a lot of jobs available, even in Lamoille County, there's plenty of, there's plenty of jobs. Um, and uh, although our unemployment rate isn't the greatest, we know the jobs exist. Some of the issues we have are people um, just aren't quite skilled enough for the jobs that are, that are out there. Uh, and so we're finding, trying to find ways with the state can help uh, make sure people have uh, even soft skills and, uh, you know, and, and, and ways that they can have leadership management positions to hopefully grow their, their personal and professional lives. Uh, and so that's what my committee has been working on so far. And um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of more of that in the next couple of months. Good morning. I'm Dan Noyce. I live in Wilkett as well. Um, I'm on the Human Services Committee. And quite recently, we've just started to really dig into some child care and how the state funds child care and how child care um, is administered. A lot of it is around federal guidelines that we have to abide by. Um, so we've been talking about that quite a bit lately. Um, and, um, and I guess that means I should give it to the Senate. Sorry. <laughs> um, we, we, Matt and I also put together a town meeting report that was distributed here. There's copies of it around that has all of our contact information on it and what we've been working on. Um, so if anyone has any, wants to reach out to us, you can email us or call us. All that information is right there. So thank you. Um, I'm Rich Westman, um, and I represent the county except for Wilkett. So, um, except these two. <laughs> Um, I serve, my morning committee is health and welfare. My um, afternoon committee is appropriations. Um, I, um, a little bit of why I um, wanted to be on the health and welfare committee is um, Dan brought up, um, I think there's a crisis here in childcare and um, it's very hard for young families to um, be able to afford things like childcare, pay off college loans, and make enough money to stay here. And um, it's hard when um, people are um, moving from um, a one place to another and being able to live here. I do see some people, I do have a few apartments, and I do see a former tenant that just bought her own house, that, which makes me smile. But. Um, um, there's, it, we are in a crisis around young people wanting to stay here and the economics of being able to stay here. And, but that crisis that we're seeing of people being able to stay here is really a crisis, I think, in rural America across the country. Um, we're having a real problem in rural parts of America and in this state, outside of Chittenden, Lamoille, and Franklin counties. Um, our population is stagnant or dropping in the southern four counties of um, the state. 
um, they're seeing population decreases. The upshot of that that comes is, if you've heard in the news, places like Springfield is on the verge of losing its hospital. And um, they're um, desperately trying to hang on to the hospital in Springfield. Um, it's hard to maintain um, small rural health systems. Here in Johnson, um, lost the doctor's office. Uh, um, Paul was my doctor. Um, it is harder and harder to survive in rural America. Um, it, in, it, it goes from health care to uh, lack of internet service, um, maintaining our roads, all of those things. And there seems to be less and less commitment at, um, at government levels, and I would say both at the state level and definitely at the federal level, um, a commitment that we're all in this together and that rural places should survive. Um, and I just give you my favorite example. Um, Vermont Electric Co-op is here, and you have a municipal here. In the 1930s, there was a commitment on the behalf of the federal government that everybody to the last mile was going to have electricity. We haven't seen that in um, Wi-Fi or broadband use. And it's a different world. And I'm not sure why we have that lack of commitment to everybody being in this together. But I see it at, at um, both the state and the federal level. And that underlying affects everything and is very concerning to me. Beth Foy, also known as Matt's sister. <laughs> Lucky Matt. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's how I take the microphone. So my question is, I totally agree with the problem with not just internet, high-speed internet. We cannot grow our society without it. So I'd like to know what you all are doing um, to further that, because I'm a little concerned when I hear no one wants to do anything about it, which is what I think I heard you say, Rich. Um, so, you know, what are each of you doing um, in regard to that? Well, let me speak for the senator. Um. <laughs> uh, no, so, so in the House side, we have, um, it's certainly an economic development issue, um, which is which my committee handles, but we have a little weird uh, issue because there's also the Energy and Technology Committee, which is supposed to handle broad, broadband and, uh, you know, and Wi-Fi things and, and cell service. Um, so, what, what, the, what the Energy Technology Committee is doing, they are very dedicated to, to really putting some money towards it uh, and, and trying to get uh, places where it makes sense to, to have um, cell phone service access because, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, uh, you know, put a cell tower, you know, in certain places in Vermont because of a valley, you know, if you put a cell tower, you might not get the greatest coverage. Uh, but then other places that may make more sense than running, running an actual hard wire to the to the residents and make more make, make might make more sense to do a Wi-Fi situation in, in that kind of um, area. Uh, so it's a little bit of both. I would I would definitely say that the House has so far been very committed to uh, taking pretty big steps. I'm not sure where the Senate is. Maybe the Senator can talk about that. But uh, the House so far has been pretty um, strong and and, and really and, and and so far the, the governor also um, allocated some money to that. I don't think it was nearly enough, but. Um, at least we recognize the, the, the problem and, and are working towards a solution. Since I've got thrown under the bus here just a little bit, but um, um, I'd say this is a problem that's been going on for some time. And um, uh, if we look back to dur when they did the stimulus package at, um, during the Great Recession, um, the federal government put millions of dollars into um, 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 Wi-Fi and internet, but the commitment was not about getting it to the last mile. It was about we're going to throw money in and creating competition in more urban areas. And in Vermont, um, we were complicit in all of that. We put money into competition in places like Burlington when they already had service. Um, we need to step back and understand that what dollars that we do, we need to put out in um, rural communities. And I'll just tell you my own personal story. My dad dies in December. Um, I'm trying to get through spring when I'm gonna gut the farmhouse to um, put, um, uh, you know, fix the place up. But in the meantime, a couple calls me and says, um, can we rent the farmhouse? 
oh, by the way, my wife um, is a telecommuter. Um, she um, needs Wi-Fi service, and there's nothing at the farmhouse. So I wasn't able to rent the place. And um, I think that speaks directly to um, um, you know, what a lot of us face. Don't Just quickly, um, the Energy and Technology Committee is definitely going to have some sort of a bill coming out of that committee before crossover, which will be the end of um, the end of the week that we get back. So they've already they voted it up. Okay, good to hear. So um, yes, so there's going to be um, some action in the House on this, definitely. Okay, hang on to a second, gentlemen. Yes. Yeah, so just um, to keep hammering on the broadband thing, as somebody who also, I know, sorry, Richie. <laughs> don't, give, don't give me that look. <laughs> so um, as somebody who also is a telecommuter, um, I am very uh, keyed into the fact that Vermont is promising young professionals to telecommute $10,000 to move here. Now, the problem is, is that in order to, you know, get, and, and they have a reason for this, they want to get the population to be a little bit, uh, younger and they want to encourage people to move their families here. Now the problem is is that without good rural broadband, um, you know, the people who are moving here are going to be limited to living in the higher density population areas which are not necessarily cheaper. It is not cheap to live in Burlington. It is not cheap to live in Brattleboro. These are areas where if you're going to get the kind of broadband that you need, and I mean I understand you know people say, oh but I can get satellite, I can get DSL. Those are not broadband solutions for people who work from home. I work from home, I have to do um, uh, you know, web web meetings with people. Um, I have you know internet over the phone. I have to push large pits, um, amounts of data up and down the internet. This is not just I'm checking my email, and you know I'm surfing the web. This is I am actually working with a lot of data, and I need a strong cable. I need a strong trunk um, to be able to do that. And I'm kind of limping along with Comcast right now. But obviously, you know, the Comcast is not exactly you know truthful in what they're what they say they're giving you versus what you actually get, <laughs> even when you pay more. Um, and I think that, you know, if we're, if we really want to attract younger people and we want to grow our, uh, you know, grow our tax base, grow the people, you know, grow our economic uh, base here, what we, we, ha we absolutely need to get better broadband um, in place and, and definitely out to the rural areas where, you know, a young professional looking to start a family and take advantage of, you know, being able to telecommute can actually do that effectively from from their house. So, hi, um, my name is Carlene Kacharzik, and I just wanted to add on to what's already been being said, but that this is a really real issue that's important. Um, I was reading something a while ago, but a lot of places in rural America, people are trying to get health insurance through the internet and then stop and actually end up not having it and not being able to be treated for those medical needs because of the internet and the slowness of it going through. So just to add on to all the voices that are um, speaking to this in another way. Thank you. I'm Lynn Sibley. Uh, first, I want to thank David for telling me I look the same as I did 30 years ago. Um, I don't believe that, but um, thank you. Uh, my comment is a general comment, and I really didn't know where to put it in um, to this discussion. But um, people have heard me mention this now for many years. But I was very um, stricken by the fact that Johnson has an identified poverty rate of 26% which means that a little over one out of four of us is living at or below the poverty level. And I do not have any answers to this issue, but I did want to raise it, and especially with these gentlemen here, um, this is twice the number of most of the communities in our district, which means our needs, I think, are a bit different from our surrounding communities. And I used to bring this up during the school district portion of the meeting, but I think we all know that poverty has a huge effect, a deleterious effect, on our educational system. It relates to the crime and the other tragic social issues 
that we are dealing with. And I think it will also impact our discussion on recreation and what are our needs for that. And to me, it, as I say, I don't have the answers, but to me it's very significant that one in four people in Johnson are at or below the poverty level and we have so many needs and services that this community needs and deserves. And I'm not sure what the answers are to that. I, I just um, say a little bit about where I think it directly has affected this community in the last um, year and a half to two years. Um, Paul Rogers' office um, had between 35 and 40 percent of his patient load were Medicaid patients. The Medicaid reimbursement level is that he received was the last he reported to me in the last year was about 71 or 72 dollars an hour he got for reimbursement. Well when you get the receptionist and you get billing and you get everything else like that he said his average cost to run the office was $120 an hour. So there's a gap of nearly $50 an hour to run his office because he had um, Medicaid rates that far and away outstripped any other um, health facility in this county. Um, if you go to the health center in Stowe, their Medicaid population is 7%. Not that I would compare anything to that, but that shows you the difference between what they have to do and the difference in the rates for those people that are um, uh, less fortunate economically in our um, community. And it is part of what made it so Paul couldn't convince a young doctor to come and take his place. So, um, and I, you know, I personally would say, um, this community needs um, uh, a health care facility. You know, um, it's something vital to say that you have a community that people want to stay. I, I, well, I'll just say that, uh, you know, with the issue of, of, of the poverty, um, especially in Johnson and, and Lamoille County in general, uh, you know, it has to do with just about everything. It's your transportation costs, it's your housing costs, it's, stagnating wages it's you know, it, it's it's all these things that just kind of pile up on you and uh and, and especially nowadays when uh, you know Lamoille is actually a growing county and i don't really know exactly why but it's growing i'm assuming because people are getting priced out of uh, chinon county or washington county and it kind of is kind of going to where they have the housing resources um and so it's a lot of things that are just piling up and um and, and I, we do a lot of uh uh, grant and, and tax rebate things and for uh, building, you know, and, and maintaining uh, workforce housing, especially low-cost housing. Um, because when, when wages stagnate uh, and you can't get an apartment, you got to go where you can find housing and then you find your job there. And uh, so, no, it's a lot of things um, coming down and we, and we constantly battle with, it, with those issues, that, you know, precisely just about every day in the state house. So it's a, it's a known issue and, and we're working on it and trying. And, It'll, you know, it won't be a, a uh, one bill will fix it all, but it'll be uh, lots of little pieces coming together to, to help. The only thing I'd like to add is one of the things that I'm working on is um, created the Older Vermonters Caucus, which basically brings together legislators who are concerned about how we're providing services to older Vermonters in our communities. And I know a lot of um, our older Vermonter population lives in poverty. so. We're trying to address the issues that have, um, that affect them. So, uh, Jeff Corey again. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, step out of the limb here, and uh, we're a town that, obviously, with all the conversation over the years, we need tax money. We need some help here. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if somehow we can change the face of the University of Johnson up here with a new charter? Where it would be uh, attraction to business, where a new large business could go in there, where they would be paying taxes, where a portion of the college would still probably still be there, as as it is right now, 
and I think there's a lot of extra acreage up there also that can be purchased. And I know it, you'd have to, it's a big thing. I mean, things would have to change. The face of the college would have to change. Probably all of the colleges. Uh, we just aren't doing it. They aren't making it. And it would create a lot of jobs. And the industry that could go in there could also work along with the college students. They could also work temporarily uh, with the businesses, helping paying their college bills, etc. It was just a thought I just had, and uh, I just step out on a limb. I can see that. Actually, before before the legislators speak to that, well, I, I just want to lead into Elaine. Okay. Um, I, I see she jumped right to her feet when, it, and um, I think she, in the immediate, has um, she was in the state house last week, and she had. Um, area legislators from here in um, Linden, and um, I think she's got um, the place is moving in a positive direction, and I think you've had a lot to do with that. And I want to tell you what a good job I think you're doing at the college, and um, uh, and give it to them. <laughs> well, I'm not here to give anything to anybody, but uh, let me let me just yeah give you some information, I guess. Uh, my name is Elaine Collins. I'm president of Northern Vermont University, so I'm the president of this college that we're going to uh, change. Anyway, the, uh, the college and the university is in good shape. Our, our numbers this year have grown uh, in a way that we have never seen historically. I credit that to a number of things. I credit that to a movement to a university structure. I credit it to the consolidation between Lyndon and Johnson and to a lot of things that we're trying to do uh, in the community. We're a very strong economic workforce development um, motivator. We in uh, Linden have created a co-working space that is providing all young entrepreneurs with broadband service. By the way, it's something that we could also do in the industrial park at Johnson. Uh, so that's just a thought. Uh, I, I'm very concerned currently as I read the news about what is happening to higher education. I think about much of the discussion thus far. We've talked a lot about quality of life issues. It's one of the reasons I came here. It's one of the reasons I'm in Johnson. Johnson has a, an A safety rating, for example. And I think that the work of our sheriff contributes to the safety of all of its citizens. My concern is this, um, as I read the papers, I'm seeing more and more universities in trouble, okay? Not necessarily the public systems. I mean, we are in need of support like all the other uh, agencies that we are, have been discussing, but the privates are in dire, dire shape. Uh, and recently we have seen the closure of Green Mountain College. We have seen the closure of, uh, well, let's see, which, which is the other? Southern Vermont College, right? Uh, and. St. Joe's is on the probation list, as well as Goddard College. With those four colleges potentially going down, I just ask you to think about the potential impact on the community, the quality of life, the lack of uh, workforce creation, and also the lack of social and cultural uh, well-being for its communities. So I just would like to ensure, and I know, and I thank you so much for all of your work. I know you're very strong supporters. I don't want to see the same thing happen here. Um, I just want to make sure that, that we, are, um, we continue to provide this community with great service. Thank you. The enrollment numbers are up. Uh, like I said, historically unprecedented numbers. Inquiries have risen probably in the range of uh, fifty percent our acceptance rates have risen in the range of seventy percent our uh, current deposit rates are also up ahead we are currently Northern Vermont University is currently ahead of all of its peers um, in the public state college system thank you uh, thank you Elena great news I echo you're doing a great job too um, and uh, I just wanted to, to say also um, we meet, uh, you know, before the legislative session starts, we usually make rounds and people, uh, you know, want to just talk generally. Um, and we had a meeting with the Union Bank at the beginning of the year, and uh, they literally said that they rely on Johnson State College uh, for, for their workforce. 
it's not like it would be nice if we had them. It's we need them. It's not a it's not a question. So they are certainly the workforce providers of our area, um, and they're young people who start businesses. Hopefully, they stay. Uh, and if we start, uh, you know, taking a little bit here or there out of their pockets, uh, I just think that sends the wrong message to our youth. You know, we don't want we, we want to make sure that they um, have opportunities to grow. And maybe not necessarily a four-year degree. Maybe uh, you know they can do a certificate or they can you know work towards a, a uh, you know an associate's degree first and work their way up. Um, but it would, you know we need to make sure that we continue to support at the state level because it's vitally important. Uh, Beth, before you start, <clears throat> we have, and I'm sure legislators will be happy to hear this, <clears throat> a 14 article warning, uh, and we've done seven of the issues. So I'm going to ask that we try to kind of wind down this conversation. I know that some of these folks have to get off to other <clears throat> venues to uh, be pummeled. And uh, so, Beth, go ahead. Thanks, David. Um, I'll definitely hear about this later. So <laughs> one thing that I just have to say is that it's not just about what you guys are doing. It's actually about what everyone here is doing whether you're a spectator or you're a citizen or you're on a board, whatever. Um, it's about us all having the same vision and knowing we need to grow our community. And growing our community means we need to have in infrastructure in place, we need to have education in place, we need to have community involvement. That's really important and I look to everyone when I say this. And um, things like housing, there's been studies that show that people who are um, low poverty at the poverty level and they're moved into housing that is nice housing, they grow um, their economic status simply from changing their surroundings. So my point in just saying all of these things is internet is really important. There's a really lot of, there's a lot of com uh, important components and we all have to be involved in growing for the future, not fixing right now. Because if we just fix right now, we're gonna spin. So we should be focused on how do we grow long term. Um, so, thank you. Uh, Doug Moldy, uh, I wanted to say that the select board has appointed a committee that uh, I consider the broadband committee because it, it has seen this and uh, I was waiting for the tireless worker, Charles Gallanter, to, to speak to that because uh, he is uh, going to chair that and drive that. He and Rob Rodriguez were our first people. We know that this is low-hanging fruit. The, I went to the housing seminar that uh, presented, uh, that Doug Kennedy presented his report. It's very clear that our economics and our housing are tied together and that, uh, that uh, with regard to jobs and people that uh, while it might be expensive to go the last mile, it is truly in fact low-hanging fruit for improving our community. Thank you, gentlemen. Duncan. Why don't you just come around? these tall people. Um, on behalf of the uh, Johnson Historical Society, uh, I want to make everyone aware of the fact that uh, we are having a raffle. Um, and what we are raffling off is the painting, which is up here, available for your inspection uh, during the break. It's a, an original Georgia Walt, uh, Balch painting and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Lois, but I believe this was donated specifically by Chuck Stern's family um, to be raffled off as a fundraiser for the Historical Society. So I encourage everybody, uh, we, there are tickets uh, back here. Um, Chuck, Chuck Conger, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, there are tickets back there for sale and uh, by all means, 
take a good look at break. Thank you. <clears throat> right then, uh, yes, Eric. Thank you. Uh, my, my preference would be that people raise their hands. Uh, and I know sometimes I may miss you. I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, it, it, makes it makes it fair if everyone is using the same method to be recognized. And uh, <clears throat> so I think hand raising would be the better way to do it. So let's work with that rather than queuing up at the mic. <clears throat> now, um, Article 8. Shall the town of Johnson raise an additional $45,000 to be used for total compensation of a recreation coordinator to, administra to administrate municipal recreation activities? Uh, is there a motion? I, well, okay, then I'm, I'm taking a raised hand to mean uh, that the motion is to raise an additional $45,000 to be used for total compensation of recreation coordinator to administrate municipal recreation activities. Is that a correct statement? Yes. Is there a second? second? There is a second. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I strongly support this article, and I ask you to vote for it. Um, I've served on the Recreation Committee for six years or more, um, and we have a very strong, we have very strong rec recreation programs in Johnson. This is great for our kids, great for our families. It's great for Johnson's reputation as a safe and healthy place to live and raise a family. In recent years, we've had a big spike in participation. In 2011, we had 289 registrations. In the past year, we've had 479 registrations. That's a 66% increase, and it's not an accident. It's because a dedicated group built high quality, healthy programs that kids and families are excited to participate in. Usage of our ball fields has increased dramatically. Mill Park is getting tons of use by many different user groups. Uh, NVU is using those fields, uh, Cambridge Youth Soccer, corporate events from other um, communities. Uh, it's, it's known as a, a real uh, hub in the county. Other, other teams really love coming here and playing on Mill Park. Um, and it's a really beautiful park. Sometimes I talk to people and they say, well, where's Mill Park? It's the most beautiful park. You go down to the end of the railroad street and you take a right. Please check it out. It's uh, open. Uh, we've now opened uh, four seasons now, thanks to the snowmobile club. Um, we offer more activities than ever before. Base in addition to baseball, soccer, basketball, we have gymnastics, archery, futsal, which is a indoor soccer, um, softball. We have lots of new activity. But with the growth and success, we've run into some big challenges. A uh, sharp increase in registrations leads to a sharp increase in coaches to recruit, in rosters to prepare, more equipment to keep track of, more parents to communicate with, more uniforms to organize, more coordination with neighboring teams. Um, as I said, Mill Park is getting a lot more use, but we're starting to experience more user conflicts there, different groups wanting to use the same space in the same time for different reasons. Should we line this to be a baseball field or do we need to line it to be a soccer field and, and these conflicts um, <laughs> take time and effort uh, and sometimes a motion to resolve. Um, the fields need more and more maintenance and upkeep, more looking after. Um, overall the volume of work is huge. Um, our volunteers are getting burned out, they're unable to continue at this pace and they need some support. So we're asking to establish a part-time recreation coordinator. Um, we're asking, as the article says, up to $45,000 in salary and benefits. This would be approximately 25 hours a week um, at a salary of approximately $18 an hour. 
I will, I'll ask Brian to break that down um, for the salary and benefits more specifically. He's um, more versed in that. Um, I want to be very clear. This is 25 hours of work each week that is currently being handled and maintained mainly uh, by volunteers. And it's not sustainable. Um, this is a job that requires a dedicated and skilled person who can multitask, communicate clearly, support volunteers, and help support the future of recreation in Johnson. Um, this is an important investment for Johnson, and I ask you to join me in supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Eric Noose. Uh, I'd like to speak in support of this also uh, and bring out one kind of important point that uh, this coordinator is not going to replace the volunteers but will be a facilitator for the volunteers and an encourager. Uh, I, I used to uh, help run the uh, volunteer program for uh, hunter education in the state and we had 500 volunteers and volunteers aren't free. It takes a lot of care and feeding. And when you have a full-time person that that's their job, you can make it way easier for the volunteers and much more uh, enjoyable to, to, to give your time. So I suspect that this position will actually be more synergetic, that the number of volunteers may even increase, and you're going to get a real bang for your buck beyond the 25 hours. So it's not just one person with 25, it's going to be a bunch of people. And I'm sure with the enthusiasm of the uh, parents and, and the kids for these kind of programs that there'll be plenty of demand for, for lots of good stuff here in Johnson. I like to stay behind the mic system. But anyway, my name is Charlie Gallanter. I support the concept of hiring uh, a rec coordinator for the for the town, but I got a problem with the numbers. I'm going to have a salary of about twenty two eight. This is according to the figures that Brian's put out. Then there's payroll taxes and insurance brings the total up to twenty seven thousand plus or minus. The um, then there's proposed to add benefits. Depending on which of Brian's numbers I look at, it's anywhere from uh, fifty seven percent to. 82% of the salary towards benefits. Now going through the town budget, <clears throat> general government pays 27% of salary towards benefits. The library pays 17% of salary towards benefits. And the highway department, 23%. The total cost from, from Brian's numbers before benefits is 27,000 plus or minus. If we take 25 percent, that would be about another 8,000, bringing the total to 35,000, not 45,000. Now the idea is great, and I support the idea, but I would like to amend the proposal to be 35,000 instead of 45,000. That's a, a motion. Okay, moved and seconded. Discussion with regard to the motion to amend. I'd just like to request a, my Jeff Bickford, I'd like to request a more detailed um, explanation of where the $45,000 number came from so that we can make an informed vote on that amendment. So I'd like to provide a little bit more clarity about what the, where the $45,000 number is coming from. Uh, there are certain fixed costs that are well predictable uh, regardless of the hire. We're going to pay $18 an hour. Uh, based on payroll, we'll have the workers' compensation, the unemployment insurance, the Social Security retirement contributions. That in total adds up to um, about Let's see, without workers' comp and UI, it's almost 26,000. When we add those in, about 27,000, a little, little bit proud of 27,000. Um, the remainder of the cost is insurance. And the town's insurance policy 
our contribution depends on what the need for the person who signs up for it is. The town will uh, pay the same percentage regardless of what policy, uh, the, the town will pay 91% of a uh, gold plan. So if you sign up for a single family with a gold plan, it'll cost the town a little bit less. If you sign up for a family plan, it'll cost the town more. Um, so that's the variation in, in price and how we round up to 45,000 is that the maximum cost if we sign up for a family plan would be 45,000. That's why it will not be an amount to exceed that. Uh, if it's a person who signs up for a lesser plan, we wouldn't spend the full 45,000 uh, and that would, would save the town money, but we can't know that in advance. Hi, my name is Linda Hill. Um, my question is, it's a part-time position. Is that full benefits or are they prorated? They are prorated benefits. Uh, it'll be the, uh, to explain pro the prorated benefits, um, this is a, it will be the amount of hours out of 40 hours, so a proportion, in this case 25 out of 40, of the town's contribution. So it'll be of 91%, the town will be paying a little bit more than 50% of that 91%. Um, it adds up to a considerable amount because it's uh, relatively, insurance is expensive, but it, it's also relatively low rate compared to some of the other departments. Uh, and uh, with the numbers that I put out, I estimated based on a two-person uh, plan, which is our, our most common plan. Casey Romero, um, I would like to know uh, from either Brian or somebody in recreation, the impact of lowering the potential hours of this position. Uh, we, I know we had some discussion in information sessions about the, the, uh, the, con the amount of hours you, you need to really attract quality candidates. Um, my concern is that lower hours uh, is gonna affect, it, affect the candidate pool quite negatively. Um, and we've had experience having fewer hours f for this for a similar position, and it you know it the the candidates that came forward were not great. So if somebody else wants to speak to that, thank you. Uh, Jess, are you offering to speak to that? Or? I am offering to speak to that. Okay, um, Jessica Bickford. Um, my background, just for reference, is I went to college to be a recreation director and then served as a director for eight years before becoming a stay-at-home mom and then going into um, community prevention services. So I have a background in this. I do not have interest in applying for this position. So to go to your question, if you're trying to recruit somebody who has the qualifications to fulfill this position, you don't want it less than 20 hours a week. And really, the more that you can do, like the 25, makes it a more desirable position for somebody who could then piece this position in with another position, a young professional coming out of college, or somebody who might be in the profession but also wants to spend time with their growing family. So 25 hours a week is ideal. Um, this pay rate is a good pay rate um, to retract somebody, and benefits may be also an attracting factor. And we have to recruit for this position well. Um, we need somebody who's qualified because otherwise it's going to be a lot more supervision on for Brian and the rec committee so it's of utmost importance that we make this a desirable position that people want to come to uh, apply for thank you I think this is a great idea I think that Johnson really needs it um, Three things identify I would, yourself to the record, please. Kim Dunkley. Thank you. Um, the three things I would ask for is possibly a cap so that we don't have it as an addition that continues to grow and grow and be in a, a burden to the taxpayers. Um, 
another piece is that that person look into being a grant writer and being able to look for grants and ways to keep their department funded as a recreation place um, and or run some events um, specific also for adults who um, might not have kids that would benefit um, the adult population be able to one one special event I would love to get going is a sap run in the spring where um, people from Chittenden County come to Johnson and run the road and um, it ends at a maple syrup place and it brings in lots of money and that way you can fund that department to keep running without um, taxpayer money. It's a little tall for me. Hi, I'm Carrie O'Halloran and I'm actually the current chair for the Johnson Recreation Committee and I have been on the committee for It'll be three years come September, and I did want to speak to what Kim just said, and part of the job description does talk about seeking and managing grants that support, enhance, and develop community goals. So that is all in our vision of this position. Duncan Hastings. Um, start by saying I fully support the uh, the idea and the concept of uh, hiring a recreation coordinator. Um, wasn't sure I was going to find myself in agreement with Charles, but I can live with the, his proposed number uh, because I was actually going to possibly propose a smaller number. Um, it's my belief that we should start out a little bit smaller. Um, and work our way up. Um, my initial thought was hiring someone for around uh, 20 hours a week, and you know, if you had a figure of about 25,000, that would cover um, an hourly rate of about $22 an hour at 20 hours a week, which, in my opinion, and based on 25 years of experience um, in municipal government, is a figure that would attract uh, a decent pool of candidates. So. Um, I'm comfortable with Charles' number, um, but I, I, for me, the issue is 25 hours triggers that uh, benefit um, level. So if we, if we went to 35,000, that would give the board the um, authority to consider that and, and uh, go with a number that they figure is reasonable. I've recognized the speaker, and uh, so he'll have an opportunity to speak. If after that you want to raise that motion, you may. So, Will Jennison, um, <clears throat> just looking for, I'm a little confused about the numbers. You're saying that we're just south of 18,000 between the salary and, and all the state commitment stuff that, so that puts a $17,000 price tag on the insurance for a part-time employee that you're paying prorated? Uh, 28,000, not 17. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. But the um, the number the number to get us to forty five is seventeen thousand dollars worth of insurance on a prorated family plan. So seven seventeen thousand dollars for a part time employee is what the village purport the, the town's uh, the town's portion would be for just the insurance. Uh, yes, it could be that high. Okay. My name is Leah Kilvadiova. Um, I would like to say that it's a little bit sad that we um, have to have a discussion about or are having a discussion about whether to provide benefits or not. Um, and it's sad that it costs that much money. But I feel that, like some other people had said before me, it's really important to in order to attract a good employee, to be able to provide this to that employee in order to do a good job. Um, I had struggled initially with the proposal of 25 hours, but came to reason within myself that a good hire and a resourceful and a self-driven person 
will be able to do what's in the proposed job description effectively and potentially more. Um, if you are looking at Johnson's economy these days, um, one area where we are potentially seeing some economic benefit in Johnson is from recreation, mostly today related from the rail trail. Um, we could potentially harness more resources by cultivating recreation in Johnson, um, and therefore I do support the position um, and will not vote for the amendment myself. Um, a parent note, um, parents and maybe grandparents will understand this uh, screen time. It's a big challenge for us and anything that can be provided to our kids to diversify their interests and um, get them out and enjoy, um, I will support. That's just one small reason among many others. Thank you. There's been a motion to call the question, which is call the question on the uh, motion to amend. Uh, is there a second to the, okay, there's a, there's a second. So you're now voting on whether to call the question, whether to proceed to a vote on the question of the amendment. All those in favor? Uh, of the motion to call the question signify by saying aye. Uh, well, the amendment was to change. We're not voting on the amendment. We're, we're voting on whether to vote on the amendment. Okay? In other words, we are in the middle of discussion. Motion to call the question says let's end talking about it and get on to vote uh, on the amendment. And so we have to vote on whether we're going to stop talking about the amendment. So all those in favor of the motion to call the question signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. I don't think it's that close, but I'll ask for uh, people to, ah. Make sure the people are behind. If, you, if you're going to vote on this, uh, you're going to have to come inside um, and sit if you're going to. You don't have to do it quite yet. Just hang on for a second. Um, yes. Can you? In what regard? No, it's not, it's not debatable. It's not a debatable motion. Um, so, those in favor of calling the question, please stand. Okay, could you be seated, please? Those opposed to calling the question, please rise. The question has been called. The question having been called, we now proceed to vote on the amendment the proposed amendment. So if you vote yes, you are going to be in favor of changing the language uh, of, our, of uh, the motion where the motion, original motion referred to $45,000, changing that number to $35,000. If you vote yes on that, we will then proceed to a continuing discussion of uh, the, the motion as amended. If you vote no on that, uh, the original number will remain in place and we will continue our discussion on the merits of the original motion. Is it clear what your yeses and nos mean? Anyone with a problem? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to amend the number 45,000 to 35,000, all those in favor of that signify by saying aye. I think there was a question. Can you restate what we're voting on? Okay. Where was the question? Yours? I just saw it generally who was a little hesitant, so can you just restate? 
Okay. Okay. All right. We we've called the question. So we're going to vote on the motion to amend. So if you vote yes or aye, you're you're wanting to amend the motion from 45 to 35. If you don't want to do that, you vote no on this. Either way, we then go on to have a further discussion on the main motion with either 45 or 35 having been established by this vote that we're just taking now. Did that do it? Okay. All those in favor of the motion of amending the original motion to change the 45,000 to 35,000, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. I don't think I have to ask you to stand. Okay. So, we are back to the main motion, $45,000. Is there further discussion? Yes. Hello, Jessica Bickford, and I wanted to build a little bit on what Leia was saying about the economic impacts of recreation. You know, when we look at our recreation department, you know, we tallied, we had the rec committee tally up the number of home games alone. This brings, there are 72 home game events. That's 72 times that there are 30 to 50 people coming into Johnson. That's, they're stopping, they're getting gas, they're stopping at the supermarket. Even if they don't stop on that trip, they're coming in and they're realizing like, oh, Johnson has a bookstore, they have an art store, there's Marvin's, we have businesses here. So in supporting this, you're bringing people to our community and many of them are going to leave money in our community and benefit our businesses. Um, the other thing I really wanted to, to bring out here, um, my other hat that I wear is as Healthy Lamoille Valley, it's a substance abuse prevention coalition. And one of the things that quality recreation does is it builds protective factors for our kids in our community. Um, first of all, it's youth involvement. Youth are engaged in healthy activities. It's um, mastery of skills. It's physical fitness. It's creation of strong friendships. It's youth feeling valued and having mentors. And all of those things go to create positive community and positive youth development. Um, so we are creating better citizens by supporting this bill. Thank you. Uh, Denise Krause, I teach archery. So uh, I think it was the tail end of the first archery season, and, and what I'm about to say spreads across the board, I believe, for all of the activities, not just archery. Um, but at the tail end of the season, uh, 2016, I believe, and if I'm wrong about that, it was uh, early 2017, I asked the archery participants at the very end, it was our last day, and uh, the kids were sort of sad, I was very sad, um, but I asked them, you know, has archery changed your life in any way? And it's a, it's a big question to ask a youngster. Some of the responses included, and this is as close to a quote as I can get, um, but paraphrased, I feel calmer inside. Another young person said, I feel, ha I feel happy when I think of archery. Someone else said, I'm nicer to my sister. And then the fourth to share with you um, from the mouth of babes was uh, something to the effect of, I can focus much longer, which I believe strongly has a ripple effect into academic success. So I just want to put the plug, it's been said before in different words, that we're talking about investing a relatively small amount of money um, in a way that enriches character development, like Jessica said, mastery of skills, a sense of belonging, um, a, a, a spiritedness in young people when there's so much uh, pulling them in directions that are, may not be favorable. Um, and I'll end by just saying that I believe that if we invest uh, in a person who's gonna work 25 hours um, at the amount that has been uh, suggested, if we're careful and we choose the right person, and I'm not applying for the job, um, if we choose the best person out there I guess I'm a dreamer and I believe that the rec program can really grow and that maybe someday within a short period of time Johnson can become 
um, the representative in our area for recreation. I can see a, a rec center sometimes when I look at the fields. Um, so I think there's an endless possibility for growth here, and it's very meaningful. Thank you. Right, there's a microphone right beside you. Okay. I'm Sue Lovering, and I agree with everything the last three speakers said, uh, but I do have two points to make. I will repeat in a small way my rant from last year is that taxes keep going up, and there are people on fixed incomes, there are senior citizens, there are self-employed people who don't get all these benefits, and don't even question that. And we look at the future of taxes becoming so high that we can't live here and we lose our homes, and if you're 25, you're not thinking about that, but when you're 65, you certainly are. Um, my question that said is how can you make this cost pay for itself by developing more income than these programs already have. And one more question that sounds peripheral, but it may affect the way people think. It's been many, many months since the Recreation Committee has posted minutes. And uh, I know they have a lot of volunteer help. I know sometimes writing minutes is a problem. I know because I do it for two boards but it is the law and recreation spends a lot of town money and some people wonder why don't we hear about it why don't we see the details so would this new uh, person be writing minutes and let us know what's going on every month and if it isn't will someone do it because it might color the way people look at this yeah that that has been a problem um I don't think that we've had a quorum of uh, committee members for quite a number of months, which is why we don't have meeting minutes. Um, and I see some uh, people who are involved who would maybe speak to this more intelligently. But um, yeah, that's absolutely something that needs to happen. Would the rec coordinator do that, or would they help support volunteers in order so that we can be better organized to, um, um, to get minutes? Um, I don't know, but yes, that is something that needs to happen. Um, Shane Spence, I just have a point of inquiry, and then if, depending on the answer, I might have a motion. Um, someone had brought up earlier that there was 8,000 budgeted in past years for this kind of a job, and that doesn't exist in the proposed budget. Um, what happens if this uh, article fails? Doesn't sound like it's going to, but what happens if it fails? And uh, you know, if we don't have anything, I might want to make a motion on that. You're correct. It, it is not in the budget that was approved by the voters just a few minutes ago. If this fails, there would be no money for a coordinator's position. And since we've already approved the budget, is there nothing that we can do to add that $8,000 back in now? Or could a, an amendment be made to this motion that would add that in? So, I mean, we, we now either don't have any funding for recreation or we have this position is our choice. I, I'm not aware, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, I'm simply saying I'm not aware of a motion uh, by which you could introduce some sort of contingency, which is I think what you're proposing. I don't, you know, I don't see that. It's not to say that Somebody might be able to think of one, but uh, and convince me that that was uh, proper in this circumstance. But on this, on the state of it, as, as I understand it, I don't believe that can be done. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, I just, I guess, a comment. Then I think uh, that having it done in a way where the the questions were separated like this puts us in this position where now we are, I think most of us in the room, myself included, are in support of this, but there isn't much of an element of choice where we are either, as I said, gonna have the $8,000 in funding that we did have for recreation, it's, it's now gone, and we either get this position or we don't. So I think we're, we're kind of put over a barrel here, and I don't think any of us really like to be there, but. 
Hang on just a minute. Uh, be, be at rest for a few minutes. Uh, trying to puzzle something out here and, and reconcile that with the clock and a few other things. So uh, be at ease and uh, I'll be back to you. I hope in five minutes or fewer, no promises. And we come back to order, please. And if there's anyone out in the hall who really wants to participate, they should start moving their feet. Present time, we have the main motion on the floor, it has the 45,000 number in it. Uh, I do not believe that there is a way that we can build a contingency into this the way it's drafted. Um, but what I believe doesn't necessarily mean that that's uh, you know all the truth and the light. Um, but that's at least where I am, where I stand at this point, subject to being convinced otherwise. So. Uh, we've had some discussion. If there's further discussion with regard to this article before we vote on it, as it has been now presented to us, uh, we're going to take that, and, uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, we can get to a vote before we break for lunch. Uh, but we'll see. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Rhoda Viss, and I just wanted to put, I am in complete support of this. I was on the rec committee years ago. I have raised three foster children who I adopted in this community, and the rec program is so extremely important to socialization for children coming out of foster care who are damaged children. This system has, the rec program has been amazing for my girls, for their socialization, to get out of the house, to meet other kids from other communities. And I have seen the work that the rec community puts into this program. Less than 25 hours is not possible. I think this is amazing that we're finally going to get somebody, and I encourage everyone to vote yes, that they're going to get somebody something to do this important job for our children and the future of our community. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Hi, Jackie Stanton, I'll be quick. Um, I am uh, support this article and position 100%. Uh, the rec department is, is fantastic, and I hope that we all voted in. In the meanwhile, I would like to formally recognize uh, the recreation committee at this table behind us who have been holding down the fort uh, for these last few years with that 66% increase or whatever it is. So join me, please. feeling I know what your response to this is going to be, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, I'm, as I pointed out earlier, the fact that the $8,200 is not in the current budget, so if this motion fails, there will be no money in a budget. Um, one amendment has already failed at $35,000. Given the complexity of that, David, is there any way that a straw poll on the main motion is in order to give us a sense of whether the motion's going to pass or not. And were the straw poll to suggest that the motion was not going to pass, then what?
Thank you very much. Well, I was what, what I was about what I was about to say. Call uh, question. What I was about to say was that, to my knowledge, in Robert's rules, there is no suggestion for a straw poll, and I think we're bound by that. There has been a. Uh, a motion or an attempt at a motion to call the question. Let me see if I can get us by one more vote. Let's see if we can avoid one more vote. And that is by my requesting unanimous consent that we proceed to a vote on the motion as it is. Now what that means is that if we all agree or perhaps better say, if, if no one disagrees to the idea of going ahead and actually voting on this thing, we can just go ahead and vote on it. But if one person says, no, I want to talk some more about this, then we'd have to go with the, uh, uh, the motion to call the question. So I'm going to request unanimous consent that we proceed to a vote on the main motion. Is there any objection to that? There is an objection to it. There is a motion to call the question. Is there a second to the motion to call the question? There is a second to the motion to call the question. Uh, this is not debatable. It's not amendable. All in favor of calling the question and thus moving to a vote on the main motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Close call. Uh, <laughs> But I think we'll now proceed to vote on the main motion. So the main motion is, it's a motion to raise an additional $45,000 to be used for total compensation for, of a recreation coordinator to administer municipal recreation activities. All in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Uh, uh, the ayes have it, the motion is passed. And, and, and as, as a reward for acting uh, efficiently within a definition, uh, we're going to uh, break for lunch. Time's up, folks. Article 9. Shall so the town vote to collect property taxes to the town treasurer in four equal installments for 32 VSA 4792 as listed below. The delinquent taxes and assessments have charged against them an 8% commission after the fourth installment for 32 VSA 1674 and interest charges of 1% per month or fraction thereof for the first three months and thereafter one and one half percent per month or a fraction thereof from the due date of such tax. Such interest shall be imposed on a fraction of a month as if it were the entire month per VSA 5136. Payments are due in the hands of the treasurer by 4 p.m. on the below due dates. <clears throat> First installment to be paid on or before Monday, August 12, 2019. Second installment to be paid on or before Tuesday, November 12th, 2019. Third installment to be paid on or before Monday, February 10, 2020. Fourth installment to be paid on or before Monday, May 11, 2020. Is there a motion with regard to this rather lengthy warning? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> motion that we collect property taxes as printed in the warning, is there a second? There is a second. Is there a discussion? Barry Cohen. Why is the interest rate so much at 8% for the fourth, fourth installment? 
that was something that was voted on by a previous town vote of the voters you know, years and years ago. We've always had it. It just seems like it would be a burden for a lot of people that are struggling to make the payments to then add the 8% on top of it. Has there been any discussion about lowering that? Not in recent memory, no. Hmm. Would I have to make a proposal or a, I would have to make a motion? I, I assume you're proposing to amend to amend the motion? Well, I would like some discussion first, but yes. Well, as well, if do the town people believe that it's a burden? Okay, well, have a seat and we'll see if somebody wishes to address those concerns, bearing in mind that you do have the option of making a motion at any time before we close the debate. Okay? Do you want to address that? Oh. It's my understanding that for the purposes of our budget, we treat the money that we assess as being real income to the town. The 8% is essentially a collector's penalty after the fourth installment. We are counting this money that is taxed as if it's coming in. So it's really, really important to the whole community that there be a way and that there be some compulsion to pay. Uh, it's not only a matter of fairness to the person or it's it's a question of the community and our paying our bills because we don't uh, we raise a certain amount of money that we tax for and we count on it coming in and I think there there might be some confusion between the eight percent which as I understand it becomes due upon delinquency and the interest which is actually over and above that. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. <clears throat> Seeing no further hands, um, the motion before you is to collect property taxes to the town treasurer. I have to do this, by the way. This is not voluntary on my part. <clears throat> um, motion to collect property taxes at the town treasurer in four equal installments for 32 VSA 4792 as listed below. The delinquent taxes and assessments have charged against them an 8% commission after the fourth installment, 32 VSA 1674. An interest charge is a 1% per month or a fraction thereof for the first three months and thereafter 1 and 1 half percent per month or a fraction thereof from the due date of such tax. Such interest shall be imposed on a fraction of a month as if it were an entire month for 32 VSA 5136. Payments are due in the hands of the treasurer by 4 p.m on the below due dates, first installment to be paid on or before Monday, August 12th, 2019, second installment to be paid on or before Tuesday, November 12th, 2019, third installment to be paid on or before Monday, February 10th, 2020, fourth installment to be paid on or before Monday, May 11th, 2020. All in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it, the motion is carried. Um, <clears throat> Article 10, will the voters of the town uh, vote to exempt the Masonic Temple from the municipal town taxes for a period of five years? Um, is there a motion? Yes. You move that uh, the town vote to, or that no, you're moving to exempt the Masonic Temple from town taxes for five years? Okay, and a second, and there is a second. Discussion. Yeah, this article you see before you is, is an article that we bring every five years. That's uh, 
by statute how long it can go for an exemption. Uh, it's something that has been approved every five years. The Masonic Temple is, you know, the landmark in the village. There is a certain uh, coexistence between the town and the Masonic Temple. The tower and uh, clock on the top is town owned. Certainly the clock is, we're a little bit of question on the tower. So we sort of need the Masonic Temple to keep our clock up in the air. So it's a benefit to each of us. Yes, Steve. Uh, my name is Steve Engel, and I'm a member at At Lodge, uh, Waterman Lodge, which is the Masonic Temple. And for those of you who don't know where it is, it's uh, located on the corner of Pearl Street and Route 15. And it's the uh, building with the pillars in the front and the clock. <coughs> um, it's interesting, uh, like uh, was said, Eric said, about the uh, tower and the clock and the building itself. And uh, a couple of years back, gave a presentation uh, on the tower and what was needed to uh, repair it. And it's, it's pretty stable even though it doesn't look that way. Uh, the uh, Masons have hired a, um, uh, en engineers, uh, structural engineers to come in and check it out and they said that uh, probably a big hurricane might take it down but other than that it'll probably last for a while but uh, there is work that should be done to it. There's work that needs to be done to the building. Uh, the Masons themselves, we don't have uh, a vast resource. Uh, we can keep the building up with what we have. Uh, our membership kind of varies back and forth and our, uh, pretty much our only source of income is dues. And we do have a portfolio which is minimal and uh, the interest from that pays most of the bills, the insurance uh, we do make donations to different uh, charities and different organizations. We have a scholarship fund that uh, students uh, would you know, benefit from if they applied for it. Um, other than that, the building is old. Uh, it was first built in 1832 and it was up on Clay Hill. Uh, it was a one-story building and it was built as a Baptist church. It was disassembled in the 1850s and moved to where it is now and reassembled as a two-story building. And at the time, uh, the tower where the clock is now was just the belfry. So uh, toward the late 1800s, a clock was donated to the town and with uh, donations and uh, uh, <coughs> local help, uh, the tower was built to facilitate the new clock and a bell, and a different bell. And that's the same tower that was uh, originally erected to hold the clock. And that does belong to the town. The clock itself, talking to Mark Woodard, who takes care of it, uh, needs some uh, help. It needs uh, either re reassembly, taken apart, uh, redone, and reassembled, or it can be kind of fix where it is. It's not the clockworks works itself. It's the rod that drives the hands on the four sides of the tower, the clock. So, uh, but that's, that's a whole nother issue. And uh, since, since there's limited funds, um, if uh, the taxes are abated, that only helps us to uh, continue uh, keeping the building up, which we would like to use more, or have the uh, community use more uh, than it already does, because uh, now we've become an LLC, and our uh, liabilities are different than what they had been in the past. So uh, we've allowed the town to use it, or the uh, recreation for the uh, winter festival that they have. Uh, there used to be Halloween parties in there that could we're more than welcome to go back and do that. Uh, yeah, other functions that the town may need a uh, place like the temple to do. We don't heat it in the winter uh, 
from May till November, it's heated. So it is open to the public. If the public, uh, you know, applies to us and asks, uh, you know, we would gladly let them use it for different functions as we have. Uh, the Historic Society, prior to moving to where they are, spent a few years there, and we were glad to have them and sad to see them go, but uh, they've moved on to a better space, and we were glad we could help them get to that point. So anyhow, that's, uh, I, I could go on and on, but um, that's the Masonic Temple. So thank you for your consideration. <clears throat> Any further comment? Carl Powden. Um, I'm just wondering if the town has any, has, has the town ever discussed with the Masons some sort of uh, option to purchase if they ever chose to give up ownership? We do grant this tax-free status uh, for a number of reasons every five years, but I wonder about the what-ifs. As far as uh, purchasing the building, no. Uh, there has been some preliminary discussions on you know, the whole tower question and whether the town would, uh, you know, there isn't good documentation showing who the ownership is for the tower. Um, it's one of those gray areas. That is an area that, a question that we have to eventually get answered is because of the maintenance of it. But as far as uh, purchasing the whole building, um, I'm sure the studio center would attest to this. If we were to purchase an old building like that, what kind of money could be invested in it? Maybe more than we would want to. I mean, we're 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 foregoing taxes on a on a regular basis. Uh, we may well have bought that building by now. Um, it, you know, if it were somehow sold to another entity, if somebody could come up with a mechanism for that, that would seem too bad having foregone taxes for all this time. So perhaps there's an arrangement to be made where the town gets some assurance in return for uh, the ability to not pay taxes. Obviously, that isn't for today, but before next five years, uh, that might be a question to address. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Seeing... Oh. Uh, Peter Moynihan, I uh, just wanted to re remind folks who've been around for a while that the uh, post office was flooded a number of years ago, and for a while the post office was in the basement of the Masonic Temple, and I appreciated that. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, giving them the tax-exempt status, and I have one question, which is, um, I've, I have a recollection of hearing that the footprint of the building is not owned by the by the Masons, and I'm wondering if that's true, and if so, who's the owner of the land? We, uh, the Freemasons own the uh, footprint, and they also own land uh, up to uh, Route 15 on in the front, on the side for Pearl Street, and the back to the Johnson Woolen Mill, and on the right side facing the building to uh, Marvin's. So we do, ha and we've granted uh, Marvin's a right of way to use uh, part of our land, which was in the original deed when Marvin's was the firehouse, uh, there was a right of way, and uh, so we continued that right of way and um, accessibility to the uh, back of their uh, building on Main Street on Route 15. <clears throat> going once, going twice. Seeing no more hands. Uh, the motion is to 
exempt the Masonic Temple from the municipal town taxes for a period of five years. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion is carried. Article 11, shall the town establish a reserve fund to be called the Skate Park Reserve Fund for the purpose of funding the operation and expansion of the skate park to be funded by unspent funds annually allocated to the skate park in accordance with 24 VSA 2804. Is there a motion? There is a motion to establish that reserve fund. Is there a second? There is a second. Discussion? Charlie Gallanter. So if I understand this correctly, in the budget we just passed, which for which the select board and the town are accountable, certain monies were appropriated to fund activities at the skate park. If for some reason those funds aren't spent, then they go to an unelected, unaccountable committee to spend as they see fit. Is that correct? I'm trying to understand if, if, the article. If, if you anticipate an answer, you probably should step back for a second and see if somebody will address that. You wish to? Um, first off, the skate park committee is accountable to the selectmen because we're municipal. Um, basically, our accounting has, in the past, really had a growing gap between sort of the way we were doing things and the way Rosemary and the treasurer and other town committees account for their monies. Um, and when I say we were, there was a gap, it's not that we were doing anything wrong, but we, for instance, were going by a calendar year instead of a fiscal year. Um, one of the big drivers, Charles, is, or anybody, uh, for this, for the need for this, is that <clears throat> all our improvements are always grant funded, uh, and they often come with a, you know, specifically you need to do this with this money, and you need to do it by a specific date uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> and so if, a, if for an improvement project, for example, if the construction hasn't been finished, um, Yes, you can get approval from the people that gave you the money that you can, you know, extend the period of time for doing the construction, but it doesn't work well with how the town has to do the books. And since all the monies that come in are actually belong to the town of Johnson, it, this, this makes Rosemary a, able to deal with the money in a way that syncs up with the way the rest of the money is handled. So it, it's a bookkeeping improvement. If I understand Charles's question correctly, any money put into reserve funds, whatever the reserve fund is that's owned by the municipality, can only be allocated by a vote of the board, of uh, the select board. It's not um, being spent by directly by the skate park, though, they would make the recommendation, presumably. So um, it would be spent. We would need to allocate those funds here. Uh, Kyle Archer, I just was uh, wondering, because in the, uh, it said that there was $3,500 currently of restricted funds in the budget. <clears throat> I assume that's because it went unspent. Is that correct? I'll let Rosemary correct me if I'm wrong, but with restricted funds, it probably was a grant fund, sort of what uh, Casey was referring to, that came in, and it has to be used for whatever the grant was applied for and, and approved by the grantee or grantor. And so it becomes restricted. Th what we're trying to do here is sort of some house cleaning, and it would allow for that crossover between 
a calendar year and a fiscal year, depending on when the money comes in, if they weren't able to accomplish the job during the fiscal year that the money came in, it's a placeholder to put it and so that they can do it after July 1st and the money's still there and it doesn't have to be, at the end of the year, the select board is supposed to have, have uh, all the monies accounted for if there's any left over. Um, I just would like to clarify maybe, I don't know if this is Rosemary or Eric, but um, how does this differ from the other committees that are out there? So formally being a rec member, rec committee member, I know that Recreation Committee has a reserve fund uh, out there that we have to get approval to spend from, from the select board. Is this establishing a similar fund for a skate park? And also I kind of feel like the talk about budgeting um, is irrelevant because if they're a municipal entity, they need to follow the municipal rules. Um, so I don't think that's part of the talking point. I just want to understand that this does align with other committees and other reserve funds for other committees, correct? Yes, by and large, it does. Uh, depending on a particular reserve fund that the voters approve that can only be used for certain things, uh, it would require select board approval to spend the money out of it. Seeing no, oh, yes, I do, yes. Duncan Hastings. Um, as a point of clarification, my understanding about the establishment of a reserve fund is for the specific purpose of doing capital improvements. Um, that worries me a little bit in the way that this article is worded because this article describes for the purpose of funding the operation and expansion of the skate park. It's my belief and understanding that capital reserve funds are not intended to be used as operating funds. The operating funds are annual budgeted funds and a reserve fund is specifically for the purpose of funding capital improvements. So can you clarify whether the intent of this article is to provide operating funds or for capital improvement? No, I would, I would agree with you that it, the intent was for capital funds because the money that was be coming in typically was grant funded. And then as I say this, I, I wonder if I should be backing up and maybe talking to Casey. Depending on the grants they get and some of the smoking stop smoking uh, initiatives probably are more operational than capital uh, and I could be wrong on that but I think you're right Doug and the intent would be more along the, the capital improvements but uh, I, I have to defer to Casey I think on this one. So with regard to grant programs etc those would and properly should still show up in the financial report as restricted, restricted funds which are held back as part of the year-end surpluses. Okay, and, that, and, and the, the skate park committee would have the authorization under normal budget practices to expend those funds as long as they're reserved or shown as restricted funds. That's different from establishing a capital reserve fund. So I just want to be clear that what we're voting for is a fund for the purpose of, of establishing a capital reserve fund. So in other words, if the skate park committee wants to develop a new bike track and that is considered a capital fund, they would go to you 
request $5,000 from the capital fund for the specific purpose of building that portion of the skate park. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting that yes from here. Uh, that was certainly in the intent, yes. So the way this is worded um, bothers me, and the reason it bothers me is because once established by the voters, no funds from a reserve fund can be spent for any other purpose than established by vote of the community. Okay, so the, having the word operation in here to me confuses the article and the intent of establishing a reserve fund. So would it be proper for me to make a amendment to the motion or the article at this I point in time? I was hoping you were going to go there. Mr. Moderator? <laughs> well, there are two ways we can go at this. <clears throat> One is the suggestion you've made, the motion to amend. On the other hand, the person who uh, made the original motion and the person who seconded the motion could uh, agree to a, uh, a change of the wording. And uh, we could go at it that way. But a friendly prob amendment. probably a more formal way and probably a better way to go at it would be for you to offer an amendment. But before we get to that, since you, it was a question posed to me and not a motion raised by you directly, uh, if I could ask Casey, she has her hand up and I assume she has something helpful to offer here. Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, okay, uh, I, the reason that, well, what makes sense to me or and the committee to keep the word operation in there is that we, we haven't for many years gotten um, grants that have funded programs like, you know, activities like perhaps what you were referring to. They have been, strictly speaking, what, you know, y'all, everyone's calling capital. That's fine. But we would love, uh, once we have facilities improved, to get grants that fund, for example, a coaching program or some other kind of skills clinics, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I call those operation. And it, and that's, and because we work in a calendar year, there's every possibility that, for whatever reason, funds that were granted in a year that's going to end in July really kind of need to be carried over to finish the program in the rest of the summer. So, I, I would love to keep the word operation in there. For, if if that for programming purposes, if that makes sense. Uh, perhaps I may have picked up something here that I didn't pick up, so let me just you know, bounce this back to you. If I understood what you said before, operational money left over at the end of the town's fiscal year could be carried. So it would be available in the following fiscal year. But the capital, that could be put in a reserve fund, which is something different. And that would be just for capital projects. Is that what you said? Who are you directing the question to? The person I'm looking at. Okay. <laughs> It is certainly my understanding, based on 25 years experience um, being in Brian's seat, that yes, there is a very definite difference between operating funds and capital funds. The and what Casey referred to would be, in my opinion, operating funds, which then could be restricted by the board and carried over into the next fiscal year. So it would be available in the next fiscal year, given the beneficence of Absolutely. The select board. But my understanding of the yeah. statute, which authorizes the creation of a capital reserve fund, is that it is only for capital purposes, right. not operating purposes. Got that. Got that very clearly. It was the other piece 
uh, of surplus and operational funds which occurred at the end of the town's fiscal year that didn't match up with the skate parks calendar year accounting. Yes. Is that, is that satisfying? Sure. Okay, so um, why don't you make a motion to amend the motion before us? Um, uh, funding what? So my proposed amendment to the main article would be to strike the words the operation and expansion of and replace it with the purpose of funding a capital reserve fund. And I know purpose it gets... of creating? The purpose of funding, funding a capital reserve fund. Funding. Is there a second? There is a second. <clears throat> I'm going to try this one more time. I'm going to request unanimous consent on the uh, granting of the uh, the amendment, which means that if you all agree on it, we don't have to vote on it, on the amendment. Is there anyone who objects to this change in the wording of the original motion? Yes, there is an objection. Therefore, we will then vote on it. Uh, there is a motion to amend the original motion by adding the purpose of funding a capital reserve fund in place of the words, the operation and expansion of. All those in favor of that signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Ayes have it. Uh, that leaves us back with now the amended um, language. Is there any further discussion on the main motion as amended? Wait. Okay. Sorry, but just just very quickly, I think there's a grammatical problem. If and hopefully it can just get fixed. Um, let's, David, could you read the motion as you as that read that whole sentence? Because I think we're missing as, a word. As presented to me. Okay. I did not craft this. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I take it as given. Yes, dear. Uh, the motion is to establish a reserve fund to be called the Skate Park Reserve Fund for the purpose of funding a capital reserve fund. For. For. That's what you need. So. For the skate park yeah. to be funded by unspent blah, 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 blah. Uh, do you agree to that? The maker of the motion agreed to it. Who seconded? Do you agree to that as well? Thank you. I'm Diana Osborne, and is that better? Better for you. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm the only one confused on this point, but the way I'm reading this article is that it's saying money that's already been allocated to the skate park that's been unspent now is going to go to the reserve fund. Correct? Okay. So I just am stuck on Casey's point of there being so many intangible things not associated with capital. I don't understand why the reserve fund has to be restricted to a capital reserve fund. Can't you establish reserve funds for other reasons, like in this case, unspent money? I believe, <clears throat> why should I believe when I have the source right here? Would you, would you, re, you Duncan, re-explain the capital reserve, the statute, et cetera? Sure, and I, I think it's, it's important to be clear about the unspent funds. 
also as part of this process. So at the at the end of the f of, of the year, um, presumably whose year? Uh, well, it has to be the fiscal year because that's the year that the town operates on. Um, then the skate park committee would sit down with Brian and or the select board and they say, we've got a grant for five thousand dollars. We've only spent twenty five hundred, so twenty five hundred that needs to be restricted and reserved into the next budget year. That's operating funds that's perfectly acceptable that doesn't go towards the unexpended funds that are envisioned in this so what what that means at the end of that process um, rosemary uh, casey uh, look at it and say we think there's going to be 250 dollars left over that the that the committee didn't spend it's that money goes that's not the skate park's money, that's our money. That's money that's part of the budget. The select board ultimately looks at the entire surplus and says, these are the purposes we're gonna dedicate those funds to. So that's part of the select board's analysis of what to do with all surplus monies. And they would look at the skate park budget the way they have traditionally done recreation and Historical Society and all those other budgets and say 250 bucks wasn't spent by the committee that's going to roll into the fund okay so that's how that process would work but as far as capital reserve funds this it's those are created by statute or they're authorized by statute they have to be approved by us the voters and once approved the capital reserve funds can only be spent for the purposes that we allow them to be by this article. And capital reserve funds are not intended by statute to be for operating funds. They're intended and specifically um, stated in the statute to be for capital funds. Does that help? Helps me. Does that answer your question? No. I, I just want to break it down a little bit. So I agree with Duncan. If we go with what it says here, we're talking about all unspent slash, to Duncan's point, unreserved. So if there is a specific purpose the money has to be used for, it rolls in regular budget, not in reserve fund budget, to be used only for that purpose. That's reserved. There is also capital money. So if money is also already out there that is um, specific for capital expenses, so basically building something new. It can't be existing, it can't be running your operation. Um, that's what these funds would go into, the reserve fund. But then there's also the issue in here of unspent funds that are not reserved at the, at the end of a fiscal year. Those unspent, not reserved funds according to this article, would automatically go into the capital reserve, which to me, I think, means that the select board cannot agree or disagree whether those funds automatically roll into the capital reserve fund. It means it would automatically happen if we vote this article in. I just want to make sure that I'm clear on all of those things. Duncan, do you agree with everything I just said? Yes, I do. Okay. So that was one of my questions too, because if we go with this article and we're taking all non-reserved funds at the end of our, our budget, our expenses for the year, right? At the end of our budget, if we take all remaining funds that are not reserved due to a grant, um, they'll automatically roll into capital, which means you can't use them for things like um, a paint job or, um, putting up new signs or whatever the initiative is or whatever the maintenance work is. Um, so I'm wondering if this is the intent of the article because I'm kind of hearing that it's not. It sounded like the intent of the article, Casey, I'm looking at you, sounds like the intent of the article was that you could, miss, you could um, have a different alignment in your budget 
Um, so you could use calendar year budget rather than fiscal year budget, but no, it's not the intent. Okay, so you want to be aligned with town's bookkeeping, and you also want to make sure that you don't get your funds taken away from you at the end of your year. Those are your two objectives. Okay, as long as the funds are for the proper use, and for you the proper use is both operating and capital. Yes, yeah, so you're saying it has to be capital and you're good with that. Yes. Okay. Right, so select board can approve carried over funds at the end of a fiscal year and you're happy with that, okay. Okay, so, okay, so the reason I actually raised my hands was not for any of this was because my follow-up question is, is, I think this is different than all the other programs just from my limited experience um, in that if they don't spend all of their funds at the end of a fiscal year, it does not automatically roll into a reserve fund. The said committee's requests that a certain dollar amount goes to the reserve fund at the end of a fiscal year. So this is a little bit different in that it would automatically go into the reserve fund. Am I correct in stating that? Would you like that? Oh, okay. I got a new player. Uh, by and large, you're correct, Beth. Uh, there are a couple of items, and I'm thinking of uh, like s small equipment in the office. At the end of the year, if we allocate, I believe, $10,000 to all small equipment in the office. Anything unused does roll over into a reserve fund, and that well, basically helps support the building and maintenance. Uh, of the building and that sort of thing. So there are a couple of, of articles that were approved eons ago by the voters for reserve funds that do take unspent funds from a line item. But it, by and large, you're correct, it does not. Charlie Gallagher again. Um, since we decided to make this a capital reserve fund, I propose an amendment that we add unspent, insert capital funds, annually allocated, blah, blah, blah. So in the last sentence, where it says to be funded by unspent, insert capital funds, or insert capital. Looking at the, the rationale is looking at the budget for the skate park. Well, hang on for a second. We gotta get a second on that. Okay. Is there a second? Will Jennison. Seconded by Will Jennison. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. So now may I speak to it? Sure. Okay. So looking at their budget, it's about an $8,000 budget, of which only about 1700 is capital expense. If they don't spend the 1700 on capital projects, then that, <clears throat> the unspent portion of that line item could roll into the capital reserve fund to be spent in subsequent years. I think it would solve the problem that, you know, it's going to establish this fund that Casey can, or the select board can draw on for matching funds, but it's not funded by, <clears throat> they've, they've got $3,800 of personnel cost in here. I don't know what that's for, but we've just voted to have a rec coordinator. Are they going to spend that 3800 If they don't spend it, that would roll into this fund unless we make the change I've just proposed. I don't know if I'm going to confuse the issue more or not, but um, <laughs> one quick point about um, unexpended funds. Um, they're the type of funds that, that uh, Casey talked about, funds that might need to be restricted because they're grant funds, et cetera. 
Um, there could be another general category of spending, um, such as that would be considered normal annual expenditures, uh, operating, what I consider operating expenses, such as, let's just use putting up signs, for example. The skate park committee could come to the select board and say, we, you know, we had money in the budget to put these signs up, but we didn't have time to do it, and we'd really like the select board to reserve $250 out, which would be applied to next year's budget. The select board certainly has the ability to reserve an annual expense from this year's budget for next year's budget. Okay, that's done as part of the annual reconciliation that the board does at the end of the fiscal year. They look at their surplus, hopefully a surplus, not a deficit. They assign a certain amount of those of that surplus to specific purposes. That's called reserving them out. You see that in the budget every year. They will list the items that they plan to reserve out. That's perfectly acceptable, perfectly doable. I think it covers what Casey and, uh, was talking about. What was just proposed presents a little bit of a difficulty because there's really two ways that you can establish a reserve fund. You can do it the way this is talking about by using the balance of the funds, the unexpended funds, or you can do it by line item, and which is really what Charles is talking about. Only the budget doesn't right now have a line item for capital expense or capital reserve fund. If the board were to establish a line item in their budget, specifically capital reserve fund, that's a very different way of funding a capital reserve than what's anticipated in this article. So you could do it either way, but it's fundamentally different. And I, the way the article is worded right now, I'm not sure that Charlie's proposed motion, unless, unless his motion included to instruct the board to establish a capital reserve line in the budget. I don't think it works. So my proposal is based on, on the current budget. There's a line item called, I lost it, oh, site improvement. To me, site improvement's a capital expense. Um, call it what you will. I, I don't know if this is a semantic argument or not, but to me, capital expense includes site improvements. That's going to be a, if you improve the site, it's a permanent, a permanent uh, modification. It's a capital expense. That was my point in making my motion. That's the only item. There's a separate item that's site maintenance and repair. Maintenance and repair is an ongoing item. Site improvement is a one-time item. It's a capital expense. Okay, this is really getting clear as mud. Uh, I, I'm afraid, probably to Duncan's point, although it does sound like a capital investment, uh, the site improvement, it definitely would fit that. It, it is not worded as a reserve for, for a site improvement or, or capital improvement. Uh, if if the article was to indicate remaining funds in the line item site improvement, I don't know if that would address it and still be what's allowable. I guess I'm looking to you, Duncan, on this little help here. Cause this is getting really confusing the way the article is starting to go. It is confusing, and I would argue that a site improvement, I, I un totally understand what Charlie's point is, but I would argue that a site improvement could be a very simple um, one-year expend expenditure. It could be a very small um, item, which in my mind wouldn't necessarily trigger capital improvement. Um, 
capital improvement generally, um, and I believe the board has a policy on what what is a capital improvement, and it's you know an improvement that has a value of X amount of dollars, um, has a life expectancy of X number of years, uh, et cetera. If it doesn't meet that category of a capital improvement, then it's an annual operating expense. And my suggestion is that the, the term site improvements is not necessarily indicative in and of itself of a capital improvement. So if that line item were changed to read capital reserve fund, then it's clear. Then that, that shows that every year the amount of money that goes into that line item goes to the capital reserve fund, goes to build a capital reserve fund. I would argue from a fiscal standpoint that it makes more sense to simply take the amount of money unspent at the end of the year and roll that over into a capital reserve fund rather than dedicate a certain amount each year to the fund. That's just my personal opinion. You may. Second. Is there a second? second, second. There is a second. <clears throat> what is before you is a motion to amend, I hate to say this, the previously amended main motion. The main motion was amended by the insertion of for the purpose of funding a capital reserve fund or the skate park. What has the, the motion under your consideration would be to further amend that main motion by inserting in line three between funded by unspent funds the word capital between unspent and funds, such that if you approve this, it would be that you are authorizing a reserve fund to be called the Skate Park Reserve Fund for the purpose of funding a capital reserve fund for the skate park to be funded with unspent capital funds annually allocated, et cetera. That's the proposal. So if you vote yes or aye, that word capital will be inserted between unspent and funds. Then we'll go on to possibly a further discussion of the motion as twice amended and then maybe sometime uh, vote on it. Are you clear on what this vote does? Okay, here, let me try it the other way around. <clears throat> How many of you don't understand what this vote is about? Okay, that's right, thank you. Thank you. A little help from my friends. That's right. Calling the question on whether to vote on inserting the fund. My error was on calling the question. All those in favor of calling the question, uh, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Okay. And everything I just said to you before now is applicable. All those <clears throat> in favor of the amendment to insert capital between unspent and funds signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no? No. The ayes stand, please. Thank you. The noes stand, please. Noes have it, thank you. So now we're back to, for the purpose of funding 
a capital reserve fund for the skate park. Is there any further discussion on that main motion? As once amended, yes. Cindy Hennard, and I, I just have a question of clarification. Um, now that we've had all this discussion, how is this different from the Recreation Committee's reserve fund? <laughs> I'm looking for some help from the reserve, uh, the uh, Rec Committee. Uh, I can help if no one Yeah, please do. Or Nat, would you know? You don't mind, uh, the question is how this differs from the rec committee fund and in my view it differs in that rec committee's budget that is not spent does not automatically roll into the reserve fund we request that money gets ro well the rec committee requests that money gets rolled into the reserve fund if there's a balance remaining at the end of the fiscal year otherwise it's similar in that um, REC committee has a capital reserve fund that is used for capital expenses and there is discussion with select board about whether the use of those funds, basically asking permission for use, to, use of the funds and um, justifying that it's a capital expense. <clears throat> Seeing no further hands, the motion is before you and that is to establish a reserve fund to be called the skate park reserve fund for the purpose of funding a capital reserve fund for the skate park to be funded by unspent funds annually allocated to the skate park in accordance with 24 VSA 2804 all those in favor signify by saying aye, aye. are those opposed no ayes have it Article 12, shall the voters advise the select board of the town of Johnson to change the inclusivity statement to read, the people of Johnson embrace inclusiveness and together we will build bridges to understanding, ensuring that all who live, work, and visit our town feel welcome and safe. Things we embrace are kindness, gentleness, understanding, neighborliness, peace, tolerance, and respect for and toward all Together, we can have a cooperative, sustainable, and thriving community where everyone is honored and valued. Um, bearing in mind, this is an advisory article and is non-binding on the select board. Is there a motion with regard to Article 12? Okay, I have, it's moved. And there is a second discussion. Hi there, Kyle Noose from the Select Board. I just wanted to give a little um, back background information on this, just because it might be a little confusing the way that the article is written. Um, at our November meeting, um, a, di a diverse group of citizens presented the Select Board with an inclusivity statement um, in hopes that the town would adopt it. Uh, and after hearing a lot of uh, compelling comments from that group as well as from all our major town institutions, NVU, um, the elementary school here, Laraway, and the Vermont Studio Center, um, we did end up adopting um, that inclusivity statement. And that is the one that is on a loose leaf paper um, that should have been on your seats or picked up at the front. And that statement reads, the people of Johnson embrace inclusiveness and together we build bridges to understanding, ensuring that all who live, work, and visit our town feel welcome and safe. We reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. Together we commit to grow a cooperative, sustainable, and thriving community. I believe my responsibility as a select board member is to have the best interests for all community members unbiased to their race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion. I support the original inclusivity statement, this one here, passed by the select board, 
because it is a true example of an inclusivity statement that is being adopted by communities in our state and country. The adopted statement is a, re is a response to an uptick of violent acts of hatred that have occurred within our community and that I have personally as a woman felt. I believe as a community, we need to unapologetically reject all forms of hatred, including racism, bigotry, and discrimination. And that is what, and that is what the original statement says which is different from what is written on Article 12. I hope that you stand with me in our marginalized community in saying no to Article 12, which is a yes to keeping the original statement as is. Thank you. Flip a coin. Hello, Jackie Stanton. Um, I was one of the people that helped write the original statement uh, that was successfully adopted by the select board. Um, I think we did a good job with it. I'm proud of it, and um, I stand by it. Uh, this newer statement in Article 12 is, is good, too. And, um, you know, it, it basically copies almost word for word uh, the original statement, except for uh, it deliberately uh, removed one line, and that line is, we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. And, and so as, as one of the people that helped write it, we uh, deliberately put that in for what I think are obvious reasons. I just wanted to touch upon uh, uh, inclusivity statements in general. For a lot of us, this is like a new thing. Um, and I just, uh, it was new for me a couple of years ago, but these uh, statements exist uh, everywhere. Um, colleges and universities, businesses, towns, cities, churches come up with statements like this, and they all include um, language that is um, uh, welcoming and inclusive and, uh, and talks about what, it, what is embraced in the community. And they include um, language about uh, what is rejected what is denounced in the community. So both of those things are present in uh, most of these statements. I looked on the internet, took me about 30 seconds. I pulled up a few inclusivity statements. This one is closest to home. It's from uh, UVM. And uh, it's, it's a long statement, much longer than ours. And uh, it has very strong we reject language longer than ours. And I'll, and I'll just read it. Um, As a just community, we unite against all forms of injustice, including but not limited to racism. We reject bigotry, oppression, degradation, and harassment. And we challenge injustice toward any member of our community. So those are really strong fighting words. And they make ours seem a little bit um, you know, they, they pale in comparison. But, um, so I just wanted everyone to be up on, on what these statements typically include and that ours is, um, is typical. Um, so I, I would hope that we would keep the original statement. I really value the we reject a portion. Um, I think it's essential to the statement for, for what I think are obvious reasons. And um, I also uh, unapologetically uh, put that opinion uh, forth, um, and I, I hope you will too. Thanks. No. Lorenda Dunham. And I think that Jackie did state some things that said fighting words. We reject. As a teacher, that's not what we teach in our classrooms. When we come in and we sit with our kids and we discuss what are the things that our classroom is going to be, we say positive things. And yet what I see here in that statement of rejection is very negative and fighting words. And I think as the town of Johnson, where I have lived here for 35 years, and I have lived in Loyal County since I was 12, but that's not what I want it to be. See, I, as a pastor who shares Jesus every day, 
do not want the words reject. I don't like fighting words. Because, see, as I come into this town, what I want to hear is we embrace kindness, gentleness, understanding. We are neighbors, and we, we promote peace and tolerance and love for one another and respect toward all. See, that's what we want our town to represent. That's what we want to teach our children. Not rejection. Of course we don't want intolerance. Of course we don't want bigotry. But we, as a people, want to express what we are as a people in a positive note. I respect everyone who is pushing for us to come together as a community, because I think that is so important. We, no matter if we are Republican or Democrat, or Christian or atheist, need to come together and work together, and we need to do it in a positive way. Rejection is not a positive way. And so I support Article 12, which says we are a community that embraces kindness, gentleness, understanding, neighborliness, peace, tolerance, and respect toward all man, no matter your color, no matter your race, uh, you know, no matter anything. We are a town that loves everyone. Kate Westcott. Um, I like both of these statements. I like the positivity of the positive statement, but I think it's important for us to also add in that what we're rejecting are things that we should indeed reject. Bigotry, racism, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. I think that deserves to be in the statement, and I think it fits right into the statement. We could have one statement that incorporates both of these. Um, fits in really well, right after understanding neighborliness, peace, tolerance, and respect, what we support, but we reject bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. Thanks. Uh, Kyle Archer, um, I'm not going to say very much other than just that as it being an inclusivity statement, it just seems very hypocritical that we would throw in, but we reject in this and this. If we're going to say that we're very inclusive, um, I think that it should just stick to being included, like, you know, how this new statement is written that we are, we embrace such and such rather than we reject. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm Molly Zapp. Um, I've been a part of Surge, showing up for racial justice, which is an ally organization that supports, um, that is basically white folks working for racial justice. Um, and I'm really encouraged that this discussion is happening at a community level. Um, and I'm hearing people saying a lot of things that are, um, seem to be on similar pages, maybe different paragraphs, but similar pages, and I think that's really good. Um, at the same time, and I think that nationwide we are seeing statements like this, particularly at universities and organizations and nonprofits, but those are usually um, smaller or more chosen communities. You know, if you have a business of um, 15 people, it, it makes sense to have an inclusivity statement of some part because um, people are coming there, you want to bring in someone, and it's such a small group that's making a decision that you can say, yeah, 15 of us, we're all on the same board. But this is for, and, and I must say that all of these things that are on both of these statements, um, I agree with, and I would really like them to be reality. Um, but I question that, frankly, that they are. And that these are things that by having things like either of these statements, particularly the, the newly proposed one, um, are possible to do with passing resolutions like this, and, and I mean this with respect, but I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this language and we're saying that we assure, ensure that all who live, work, and visit our town feel welcome and safe. I really wish that this were true, but people who live here suffer domestic violence. I mean, People, there have been black folks here whom white 
either Johnsonites or area residents have yelled at and harassed. And I, I think that part of why this is happening is saying, we don't like that. No, we don't like it. It's wrong. Um, but to say that, but these statements like this, I feel like they're saying that we've already done this work. That, you know, um, hey, we can ensure that people feel safe. No, we can't. We have 3,000 people here. And while I support this as a community goal and as an individual goal and the social change behind that, um, I just, to me, it sounds like branding ourselves as people who have already done the hard work of racial justice when this is something that takes decades to do and work at community levels and personal levels and not just statements. And I see, and I have seen some great things. I mean, the, the demonstrations, the weekly protests, which I have occasionally gone to, I think, I think there is positive movement. I just question that um, if this is what our statement is, what are we doing to show it? Or are we just passing a statement that's essentially white people patting ourselves on the back? Thanks. Jasmine Uris, um, in response to Ms. Dunham, um, I am a mother and I'm an aspiring teacher um, and I believe that um, it is right um, and just to teach all children to reject racism. Rejection um, is not, um, uh, you know, in in many different ways, rejection can be a negative thing, but in these terms, rejecting racism, um, discrimination, and bigotry is very positive, and I will continue to instill these, um, these thoughts and ideals in my children and hope to do it in classrooms in the future. Um, thank you. Hi, I'm Glow Webble. I'm your resident gay woman who comes here every year and wants to say that we, we really need to um, keep in mind what we are rejecting um, in light of uh, things aren't getting any better in, in, in the world on a, on a national level. I have watched, I would have thought by now, after 20 years, that we wouldn't be revisiting some of the things that are coming out of the administration in Washington that want to overturn some of the advances that gay people, transgender people, bisexual people have, have fought for and made, you know, in the last 15, 20 years. I would like to propose that there be a compromise here that we keep the language that you work so hard to, to do by keeping that sentence, having that original statement that you wrote, which I think was well done, and also maybe then including the inclusivity statement where it says, the things we embrace are kindness, gentleness, understanding, neighborliness, peace, tolerance, and respect for and toward all, that that would also be included in, in the statement so that it is a combination of the two. Therefore, we have taken care of making sure that we know what we're rejecting and teaching. I worked in the school systems after I left out and about. I mean, I've got to tell you it out and about, I had to talk about we were rejecting ageism all the time. You have to talk about the things that are not okay. You really can't just sweep them under the rug because then we have a president who's doing what he's doing right now. I'm sorry if people agree uh, with, with President Trump. I, I find it very difficult what's going on there. Um, you have to keep in mind what we reject and also put out the vision of what we want to embrace. I think there's place for both of those things here. Thank you. I make a motion. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
in order, hang on just a second. <clears throat> Everybody hands down, please. I, when I saw this article on the uh, non-binding side of, <clears throat> of the warning, I have to say that I, <clears throat> I did anticipate the, the possibility that uh, some of you would wish to edit the language which appears here, which is the, the place that we're at right now. My thinking, I'm going to share my thinking with you, and then I'm going to, you know, if somebody's talked about a straw poll. Now that we're on the non-binding part of this, I'm probably going to go to a straw poll. Um, I thought that the potential for editing the material that appeared in the warning could be endless. Um, and that my preference, this is only a preference, it's not an order, it's not a command, I'm not taking anything away from you. But my preference would be to deal with this motion as it was presented in the warning. And I, I say that simply for efficiency. I take no position on either proposal. Those of you who know me pretty well probably know pretty well where I stand on the issues raised there. But that's not why I'm here. I'm not here to share, you, share with you any of my thoughts on the merits of any of this stuff that appears here. So, straw poll, I'm going to give you a choice. Do you want to proceed? in the manner in which we have been proceeding here to four, which would uh, allow for uh, uh, a motion to amend or serial motions to amend uh, to consider this on the one hand, or just vote on what we have on the paper here today. So who wants just to vote on what's on the paper? Sorry? Yes. The motion is to advise the select board of the town of Johnson to change in the inclusivity statement to read, quote, people of Johnson embrace inclusiveness and together we will build bridges to understanding, ensuring that all who live, work, and visit our town feel welcome and safe. Things that we embrace are kindness, gentleness, understanding, neighborliness, peace, tolerance, and respect for and toward all. Together we can have a cooperative, sustainable, and thriving community where everyone is honored and valued. That's what's on the warning. What's proposed, as I understand it, and I can correct me if I misunderstand this, is that uh, the last speaker would propose to include the contents of the earlier statement that the select board adopted and then I think some further language beyond that. Do, do I have that correct or correctly or not? Just putting in one sentence. Please come to the mic. So the amendment that I was making to the Article 12 was to insert one sentence from the original inclusivity statement which read, we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. Okay, is that, that's the only? That was, I was just. The only piece, okay. Yeah. okay. All right. So that's, that is the proposal. I return to my original question. Uh, do we want, well, five, four, three, two, one. 
Um, I, I, that, I can't say no. Okay, well, <clears throat> what I have, I have a motion to add to the statement that I just read, the sentence, we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, hatred in all forms. Together we commit to growing a cooperative, sustainable, and thriving community. That was a properly made motion for an amendment. And I take it to be so. I ask if there's a second. There is a second. All right. um, so that is, that was a motion to amend, which is debatable. Do you wish to debate it further? <coughs> yes. Okay. Right My name is Rhoda Mingeldorf, and I just, I'm not really sure that I understand rejection of uh, who's being rejected, for instance. I looked up bigotry, it says intolerance to those who hold different opinions from oneself. Now, I can understand that if we adopt this, that um, people who would have different opinions from me, for instance, would have to be tolerant towards me. And people that come into our town on Tuesday nights and see um, what I might call bigotry on the streets, waving flags and signs, maybe we'd have to stop those. So that would be my understanding of um, rejection of bigotry, is that there are people in the town who have dis you know, differing opinions that are not, you know, in my opinion, wrong. You have an opinion, I have an opinion, but we, we have to be accepting of other people's opinions. It doesn't mean that I have to share your opinion or that you have to, you know, I have, that you have to share mine. But we need to be accepting of other people's opinions. So is that, is that, um, I'd like to know, is that what this is intended for? We reject bigotry, for instance? <clears throat> tolerance to those who hold different opinions from oneself. Just as a matter of Robert's rules, to which I recur, what we are debating is the amendment. Do we want this amendment or not? I guess I could get that under the rug you know, of this particular motion, but uh, let's, let's just address whether the, the merits of the amendment. Yeah, this is the amendment yes, I, I know that. I understand that. The amendment is to add it back in, uh, the, the statement that we reject. Make sure I get this right. Racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. To keep that statement in, is to acknowledge that those are real issues and that we recognize the real issues and that they exist in our community. It is not to say that that work has already been done or completed, and it is not to say that recognizing it will change the hearts and minds of everyone in the community. What it does is plants a flag and says that these are boundaries that we believe in in a community. We believe in inclusivity. We reject racism and bigotry. Those are clear boundaries. Boundaries are important. We've had a few people invoke their experience in various fields today. I've worked in education for 17 years. I understand the importance of clear boundaries. This is what is acceptable. This is what we as a community say is not acceptable. I support keeping the language of rejecting those forces because to do otherwise is to pretend that they are not problems in our community. And that's willful ignorance. I'm Kylie Galately. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much. It is about acknowledgement. Um, to speak to the negative language, though, which I think is something that hasn't been addressed, um, this is really about a double negative. It is about making 
empowering a no, which in the past two years has been a really big social movement, and it's very important for us to realize that no is not a negative thing. No can be accepting to the opposite of yes. But what I want to, I really just want to emphasize that it is a double negative. And these are, I mean, r racism and bigotry and discrimination, it's not about the individual who is feeling or practicing, it's a system. And, and I also unapologetically reject these things. And to plant that flag is a very significant move and to not is very loud. Thank you. Ditto on the last two speakers, and again, on Kim Dunkley. Um, we're naming what we do not want in our town. And if we don't name it, how do we, how do we go to the next step? So this is a baby step. And hopefully, it's the baby step that gives us a door to open up to education to find out what we do next. And I'm hoping that we make that step, and I'm hoping that we keep that language. Greg. Uh, Greg Stefanski. Uh, I know we've been here uh, a long time today, and uh, I just want a quick pause, encourage folks to kind of take a deep breath. Um, these conversations are, are really difficult, but um, you know, for, for some of the, the differences that we've been hearing, this obviously is a concern for this many people to stick around this long uh, at a town meeting, is impressive and says a lot about the heart and the soul of our um, community. And that I think, you know, before we get caught up too much in the sort of the, the tension of uncomfortable topics um, and expectations, uh, to recognize that some of these conversations that have started a few months ago. Uh, are really represent sort of the best of who we uh, are as a, as a community, um, and I think it, you know it's. And we ha I think we have to be careful too around when we use words like reject. What are we rejecting? Are we rejecting people, or are we rejecting certain actions um, or opinions or harmful words uh, that that might be shared? Um, when you think about wedding vows, um, we make some statements in there, so the aspirations, and also sometimes we make some statements about the things that we don't want to see happen in our relationship. Our work at Laraway with kids, we have language in a lot of the documents that we share with our kids, with our staff, that say, we're not going to harm you. That should be pretty obvious for an organization that works with kids, but sometimes for whatever issues that have come up, there can be a level of mistrust or misunderstanding, and so we felt it's very important to make very clear statements about what kids and their families can expect when they're connected to our organization. Uh, sports, we talked a lot about sports and our recreation in our community, and there are statements at most games that you go to now uh, that set some clear expectations about how fans are gonna act, how they're gonna treat the officials, how they're gonna treat coaches and other players and specific things that you cannot say and that you cannot do uh, to players, uh, coaches, um, and officials. So again, I just, uh, you know, a pause for a deep breath and a, a celebration, if that feels appropriate, so, uh, of us coming together to have this conversation. And also, as one of the earlier speakers mentioned, uh, making statements is easy. It's the work that comes from those statements that is what matters most. So I think we need to think about with whatever statement we land at, what are we going to actually do to promote and support that statement? And importantly, what are we going to do when that statement uh, and that aspiration hasn't been met? So I know that there are some conversations happening at the select board level and maybe with some other uh, bodies in the community about the work to be done um, because um, making statements is, is easy compared to actually changing actions. Thank you. Hi, Rhoda Viss. Um, the problem and the only problem I have with this is the word reject. I would put forth that we put, we do not accept. I have children, as I said, that are foster children. Children that come from damaged homes. The word reject 
has a huge connotation, a shameful connotation. And in any psychology, you're going to know, you shame somebody, that puts it in them, that rejects them. Reject is not the word here. None of us want bigotry or discrimination or any of that in our town. We all lo want to love each other. We want to be accepting. That is the word we need here. We do not accept these behaviors. We don't reject you. Because if you reject someone, how can they change? They can't. You've shamed them. So I just ask that you change the wording to, we do not accept. Thank you. Take it that's a motion. That is a motion to amend the amendment. That is a motion. Yes, sir. Is there a second? There's a second. Oh, no, no. We just pile them on and then we go in reverse order. <laughs> go in reverse order. So now what we're talking about is just the, the issue of the substitution of do not accept for the word reject. That's, that's what's on the board. Yep. You had your hand? Oh, okay. Well, no, you'll get it later. We'll get, we'll get to that one later. Margo? I can't, I can't hear you. My name is uh, Margo Warden, and I'm the word reject is the word that really got my attention in this, and it's one that I feel very strongly about keeping. Um, I remember 26 years ago, uh, my husband and I were first starting the process of adopting our children. And um, as we were going through the process, the adoption counselor said, everybody loves a baby. They're just so cute, and that's, I know that's what you're thinking of but we want you to think forward and how will you feel about being the mother of a 21-year-old black man? Like, what are you going to do? Um, how will you work? And we were very naive. And it was really the idea of, well, we said we would, we'll, we'll raise them so that they have a solid core and confidence and self-esteem so that when the bumps come, that they will be, they will be able to work from a place of strength. <clears throat> to say that we were naive is just really, um, it doesn't do it justice. Um, in terms of what we've learned over the last uh, 26 years, now raising uh, two young men of color, is the, uh, the, very, the systemic nature of racism. The uh, ever presence of what we're swimming in of you know, implicit bias and, and, and white privilege. And I'm not like really, I'm just naming those. This is, these are the things that um, my sons and other uh, you know, people of color are uh, facing every day. So I would say that this isn't the time, to perhaps we have an opportunity now to um, not sort of go quietly and generously and with love to quietly speak against racism but to really uh, denounce it and reject it. And in terms of religion, I was uh, raised a Roman Catholic and have served as godparents for a number of uh, children. And I, the vow that I had to take was like, do you as godparent reject Satan and all of his work? And, and I think in that sort of like, we, it's like, yes, it's like, I'm just thinking of Satan. I don't even know how to picture that actually. But like power, right? And, and, and something that is just so big that has to be met with something like rejection. There's a difference between rejecting Satan and not accepting him. So I would vote for the word and the power uh, and the message behind rejecting. My name is Dean West, but I'm speaking for um, Barb Bacchus, who was not able to be with us from a, a, she's called away for a family emergency, but she left a statement that I'd like to uh, deliver for her. 
<clears throat> my name is Barbacus, obviously not. I am the one who submitted the version of We Embrace, the inclusivity statement. I strongly support that if we have a statement, it should be in the form of We Embrace rather than We Reject. The overall message is still the same, but it focuses on where we want to be. My experience is living in Johnson all my life so far is a community that embraces kindness with your neighbors, which can mean the person across the street or the person across town. The person you meet in the post office, Sterling Market, place to eat or place of business. I'm not dismissing that there are incidences of hate, cruelty, and disrespect going on in our world, even in our small town. I acknowledge that they happen and I agree that incidents that spread hate in all manner are unacceptable. As a community, we have to work together in being accepting and tolerant. The word reject goes against the point of having an inclusivity statement. Psychologists agree that the term reject makes people feel angry and aggressive. It moves us from a place of belonging to, belonging to destabilization and feeling disconnected. Rejection is what leads people to violence. By including that term in our inclusivity statement, we're actually triggering people to feel the opposite of what that statement intended. If we, the citizens of Johnson, are caring and supportive of each other, in an accepting and respectful way, then we should highlight that aspect of our town. Our inclusivity statement should highlight that feeling of belonging and acceptance so everyone, townspeople and the community at large, knows that those traits are what we hold as truth. That's Barbacus's statement. I'd like to expand on that just a little bit, if I might. <coughs> on a statement of my own. I don't know how many of you may know Barb. <clears throat> she grew up in Johnson. She went to school in Johnson. She raised her family in Johnson. And then she chose, after losing her husband, to continue to live in Johnson by herself. She's always been very active in the community and it's always been for the betterment of the community in all the affairs that she worked in. She worked in the school. She has a strong passion for making Johnson a good place to live. She, her statement is a wish to portray Johnson as a desirable place to live and thinks the statement should promote that to all who may be looking for a good place to settle, to make a home, and to raise their family. The statement is more to promote Johnson to people who are looking for a good place to live than it, and, and, and describe what Johnson really is. We hope that only good people will choose to live in Johnson. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jackie Stanton. I just wanted to chime in about this word reject. Um, I I've noticed, and I don't know if any of the rest of you have, if you drive through uh, Jeffersonville, um, there's a huge banner on the outside of the United Church of Jeffersonville. And um, it has all these bulleted statements, and, um, and one of them is uh, reject racism. So this is on a church, on the outside of a church, smack dab in the middle of a tourist town um, that all kinds of people are coming and, and going to, to visit Smug. So uh, just another opinion that that word reject isn't rejected <laughs> by, by, by so many other people. Linda Moldy, 
think you need to be clear about what exactly you're rejecting. You're rejecting bigotry and so on. You're not rejecting the bigot. The bigot, that is the person who's behaving like a bigot, needs correcting, could be confronted, um, may resent it like crazy, but you're rejecting the bigotry and not the person. And the other thing I wanted to say, uh, somebody said don't mention the Ten Commandments, but <laughs> the Ten Commandments are guidelines for behavior. And eight out of ten of them say thou shalt not. There's something in human nature that needs a bottom line that says don't do that. So even when you're dealing with little kids and you're trying to encourage them, and not just little kids, but adults too, you're trying to encourage them in the way that you want them to go, that you think everybody should be able to behave, you still sometimes have to say, stop it. So just be clear um, what it is that you're rejecting. It's not the person. It's not a person who thinks differently from you. It's it's a person who thinks differently be from you and is you're not rejecting the person but you're rejecting the behavior that doesn't fit in with who you think we are uh, Sue Lovering I have to point something out that hasn't come out in the last hours, that this is a wonderful place to live. And there are very, very few people here who you'd call redneck or racist, I think. And I get kind of offended when I hear people jump up and down. I've seen it in videos. I've seen it in the news. Oh, we don't have a diversity here. Diversity counts everybody, not just the people you don't like. And I'd be the first to say I have no sympathy with a racist or the way they behave, um, but that person still has a right to say their feelings, and, and as, as dismaying as it may be, they actually have a right to hang that flag, which none of us would like to see. But the day it becomes a place where we got a sign at the town line saying, if you're racist, you can't live here. If you're doing something I don't like, you can't live here. And then that starts sounding like Adolf Hitler. And if you think that's a stretch, he started the same way. So when I hear somebody talk about the next step, I get a little worried. Because if you're talking about having ordinances or laws against certain types of people here, I don't want any part of it. Denise Krause, I'm inspired by the conversation. It's clear that a decision will be made about the verbiage I think what's clear to me also with that is that once verbiage is chosen, each of us will perceive the words that are chosen a little bit differently, and so we can't really govern how each of us will perceive the words. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is redundant in that it sounds clear to me that all of us are talking about behaviors, not the person. Um, and it sounds like so, m so many of us believe that each person can evolve. And then finally, um, what I'm most excited about, regardless of which way we go with the words, is that we're, as a town, encouraging one another to have the courage and the strength to step in with action, non-aggressive words, when we see someone being treated unfairly, um, someone being threatened. With or without this statement, if I'm on Main Street or a side street and I see someone being treated poorly, I'm stepping in. I don't care how big or small I am. And that's my personal choice to make, and that's, that's important to me. I feel like the power in the inclusivity statement that we're discussing, again, regardless of which way we go with the words, is that more people might be encouraged to step in in a, in in a benevolent but powerful way to slowly change um, the way that human beings can potentially hurt each other so that everyone feels uh, safer. So I think we're doing a great job here. Thank you.
Will Jennison, and I actually have a question versus a statement. Eric, since you're the chair, um, has this inclusive statement been accepted by your board? The one that's the one that's uh, we're trying to amend. No. It has not been accepted. Okay, so you have a small group of people come to you with a statement, and you guys take it under advisement. You have not accepted it yet. No. no. <laughs> the one on the piece of paper here is the one the select board did adopt. Okay, so you have adopted that statement. Yet today, um, you have town meeting where you have a large group of people versus the small group of people that presented this to you and you guys accepted. But today, this is a non-binding element of the town meeting. Why is this a non-binding versus an actual article? Uh, it's a legal distinction in state statute about what is allowed to be called a binding and non-binding. We're very limited about what we can declare as a binding article. Okay. Uh, and this is not one of the few things we can call binding. Okay. So then it, with, with that, thank you for the explanation. All the members of the board. So today, being a non-binding resolution, um, if this body here after a couple more hours <laughs> comes up with an actual representation of the majority of the body, what is your intent as a board to uh, move forward with this inclusive statement? Yeah, I think the board would be committed to abide by whatever the wishes are of the voters. Okay, thank you. Hey there, Scott Meyer, um, white guy. And a lot of people have added old, so I guess I'm the old white guy um, with long hair, even worse. So on the statement of rejection, um, I flew back into the country a couple of days ago, and I'll try to make this short. Um, two hours in immigration, a uh, long time to get back into the country um, that I belong to, and I was questioned on my nationality by somebody who had broken English and who was not white and was not a guy. And my lizard brain thought, this is crap, being questioned by somebody who's obviously not born in the States. Horrifically, I thought, I'm an idiot. And the initial statement, thanks to Kyle and Jackie and so many others in this room saying you should be rejecting this, hit me like a ton of bricks. I've always thought of myself as a liberal, open-minded person who appreciates everybody, regardless who they are. But in that moment of no sleep, two hours on an immigration line, being questioned by somebody who was not old, who was not white, who was not a male, sort of crept in. So what I'm getting at is this statement went through my head like lightning. And I realized I was being a poor individual, a bad representation of what America should be. And I just want to say that the statement works. Um, I used it on myself. It was self-corrected. I didn't end up in immigration jail for saying something stupid. <laughs> and I'm a better person for it. So for the people who wrote the statement, thank you. It improved me um, quite a bit. Uh, Eric Hutchins, I'm a teacher in this community as well. Um, first, I, I think it's phenomenal how many well-intentioned people really care about the way our town is represented on all sides of this particular statement. I think it's, it's great, so thank you for that. Um, I think we're really, this debate's really about one sentence, which is the one that says, we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. It seems pretty elementary, I think everyone could agree with, and there's just one problem with the word rejects, um, and I get that that's a negative thing, but you know, as we teach our kids, you know, it's great to tell kids to be healthy, but if you don't tell them, that means not eating unhealthy food and not smoking and not drinking, that you're not really filling in the blanks as to what that means. So we can say be tolerant, but for kids, we really need to lay that out and what things we're, we're keeping, what things we're getting rid of. Also, I think we're, a lot of us are thinking about this statement in terms of 
um, how it makes us feel, you know, the people who are generally not the victims of these kinds of incidents. But if you extend it a little bit and like think about if you're a victim of homophobia or racism or bigotry or sexism, uh, would you want kind of a lukewarm rejection of that um, discrimination or would you want a strong rejection of that discrimination? I think it's pretty clear that if we're trying to send a message to people who maybe walk into our community and look around and wonder whether they belong here or not, that a strong statement rejecting these things is the best thing that we can do. And you know, as a teacher up at the high school, this is what we teach. You know, we teach kids to reject bigotry, racism, intolerance. Uh, when we teach about you know, anti-Semitism during the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, we don't see, well, there's both sides. No, we tell them that that was really bad and we don't ever want to go down that road again. And we can do that by making a strong stand now. I think these statements are a good start. Clearly, we all have a lot of learning to do and our community can be more tolerant, but um, having a goal for what we want to see and, and what we don't want to see in our community is just a good starting place. Thank you. I, I had um, <clears throat> called on Rick to, to speak before that motion came, which came from someone who wasn't recognized anyway. So um, Rick, why don't you have your say, and then if someone wants to be recognized for a further motion, be happy to hear it. My name is Rick Opperly. Um, David brought up something this morning uh, that uh, yesterday was Vermont Day. Uh, 1791, uh, Vermont became the 14th uh, state in the nation. However, 14 years before that, uh, the Constitution of Vermont outlawed slavery in 1777. Let me tell you, in 1791, slavery was still a pretty popular idea in America, not so popular in Vermont. By 1860, we had a divided nation and a nation at war because we couldn't come to a common understanding about whether people should be slaves or not. It took another hundred years for Martin Luther King to march on Washington, and we got the Voter Rights Act, and we got civil rights legislation. Well, we're at a, a tough point in our evolution right now because we have to make things clear. We also stood here this morning and we recited, recited the Pledge of Allegiance. And I believe the last three words of the Pledge of Allegiance were justice for all. Not some, but for all. And we agreed with it. Justice isn't always popular, but it's usually right. I support what the select board did in its unanimous decision, four to one, to stand up and reject those issues of racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred, because they are issues. They're not just people, but they're issues, and they're tough issues. And there's gonna be a lot more conversation around this. I was part of the movement to get the inclusivity statement going, and it has evolved over time. We're having this conversation right now at this meeting. I support the select board's decision, and I encourage people to go to your select board meetings, and if you have something to say, these people will listen to you. You may not get the answer you want, but they're willing to listen to what you have to say. This is a good place because there are a lot of people here, but the real nuts and bolts, as this board will tell you, goes on every month at meetings, and they do their best to represent the town by attending those meetings and working on those tough issues. So if people want to add something to the inclusivity statement, go to the select board, go to the meeting, and Express yourself. Thank you.
Mike Dunham. I was the only dissenting uh, select board member when the inclusivity statement was approved last year. I did it for this particular reason, for all of us to discuss it. And we all have discussed it. <clears throat> what does not happen uh, in American politics, especially in Washington, is compromise. So what I have heard today from my friend Glow is a compromise. Okay, she basically echoed uh, Barbara Backus's statement, and then she added, she kept it the way it was, is my understanding, and she just added, we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms, okay? So to me, that is a good compromise. And as a town, we should compromise, and we compromise with our family members from time to time, just as we compromise with our friends and our neighbors. So I would, and I want to say one other thing. If we do not compromise, by the end of the day, they will be an inclusivity statement in the town, okay? If we leave things just the way they are, they will be a winner and a loser in people's minds. But if we compromise, we will all be winners in this town. I, I have, I'm going to offer you the shortcut one more time. <clears throat> I'm seeking unanimous consent that we begin to vote on the two amendments in the main motion without further discussion. Does anyone object to that? Holy cow. <laughs> oh, don't you dare. <laughs> no, Eric just kind of got a finger up, which I assume was in jest. Yes, okay. All right, so the, the motion to uh, or the previous question is unnecessary since we're going to proceed to voting. And we have, no, we're not, we've, the, call, the question has been called by unanimous consent. I've requested unanimous consent that we end discussion and move on to the Herculean task of sorting out amendments from amendments from main motions. Where? <laughs> Just left. So here's the history. And we're gonna, we're gonna go backwards. We're gonna end up going backwards, but I'm gonna start going forward. And going forward, we had a motion which in substance is restated in Article 12 of the warning that you had before you, which is what I would call inclusivity statement two, okay? And I say that because inclusivity statement one is the one which was presented to this board and it then acted upon it and adopted it as policy for the town of Johnson. And that's, I will call, inclusivity statement one. Are you together so far? All right. So inclusivity statement two was presented to you and someone made a motion that that's what we should adopt and it was seconded and it was discussed. And in the course of that discussion, <clears throat> a motion was made to amend what was in Article 12 which was inclusivity statement two, by adding the following language. We reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. Together we can commit to growing a cooperative, sustainable, and thriving community. So somebody proposed that amendment and it was seconded. There was further conversation, further discussion, at which point a further amendment, an amendment to the amendment, was offered, which would substitute 
in what I just read you, do not accept in lieu of the word reject. Okay? We all remember all of this? Oh, good. I'm doing well. Now, in order to get through this tangle, what we have to do now is turn this thing around, and we've got to start by voting on the last motion that I've, I got here. And that was the motion to substitute do not accept for reject racism. So that's the first thing we're going to vote on. So if you want the words, do not accept, inserted for the word reject in the, as presented, you would vote yes. If you don't want that, if you want to keep the word reject, racism, blah, 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 then you would vote no on this motion. Are we all clear on what we're for and what we're again? Okay. So, all those in favor of the amendment to add, uh, do not accept in lieu of the word reject, all of those in favor of that say aye. aye. All those who oppose it say no. No. No's have it. So, do not accept will not be part of the final motion. Next, we deal with the First Amendment. And the First Amendment proposed to add to what appears in the main motion, which is Article 12, the words, we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. Together, we commit to growing a cooperative, sustainable, and thriving community. If you want those words added to the text that appeared in the warning, you would vote yes. If you know, you would vote yes. Or is this a? What is the relationship between what you just read and what the selection included? No. No. What appears here, which is the main motion, is a redrafting. No, it's it's an amendment to this. You, can I clarify? I, Go ahead. My amendment, I never, I don't know if you got clarification of where it goes into Article 12. That it goes, that it goes before the sentence, the things we embrace. Before the sentence? Yeah, it goes. The things we embrace? Okay, all right, all right, all right. All right. Well, it's, it's, okay. it's added, it's okay. This is just a correction of placement, not of, of the words. So the, the amendment, and I'm gonna read it again, the proposal for the, the First Amendment was, we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, etc. And that was proposed to be entered between the word safe and the word the in line one, two, three, four of the warning in Article 12. After safe and before the things, it was, it was proposed to insert the language that I just read, we reject, blah, blah, blah. Yes, Casey.
Can I see it? Yes, Margo. Yes, I will do that. I will do that. <coughs> yeah, I know. We'll deal with that. Um, all right. So, the amendment, as I understand it, would insert between the words safe and the things we embrace would be simply we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms, period. Okay, and then it would go on the things we embrace are. All right, so if you want that language inserted into the original motion, you would vote yes. If you don't want it, you would vote no. Okay, clear? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Ayes have it, and so the main motion, which we now have, <coughs> reads as follows. Um, motion is to advise the select board of the town of Johnson to change the inclusivity statement to read, quote, the people of Johnson embrace inclusiveness and together we can build bridges to understanding, ensuring that all who live and work and visit our town feel welcome and safe. We reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, violence, and hatred in all its forms. The things we embrace are kindness and gentleness, understanding, neighborliness, peace, tolerance, and respect for and toward all. Together we can have a cooperative, sustainable, and thriving community where everyone is honored and valued. That's the main motion which is now before you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No, no, really, uh, seriously, the folks who are headed for the door, hang on for a second. Well, see how much influence I have. I just, I just want to, you know, point out that at town meeting in Johnson, over a number of years, we have dealt with a number of very contentious issues. Uh, and I've got a 30-year span to, you know, see that. Every single time we had a really hard question to answer, a hard nut to crack, it was my observation that people who had argued the point, some of them the, who had argued most passionately on one side or the other, uh, left together. Uh, which I think is a very, very, very good thing. Uh, so let's keep up that tradition. Now, the, that, that being the sermon, uh, Article 13, shall the voters of the town here report from the Johnson representatives on the Lamoille North School District? And I think uh, I'm not going to deal with that as something that requires a vote. I would just invite the uh, school board members here, who I assume are prepared to report, to come on up, take these seats, and report on. Hello all, I didn't prepare any report. Um, the budget you're getting ready to, um, or you've already voted on, basically keeps things going, running rather smoothly within a district. Um, the modified unified, unified portion of it, I'm sure you know that Cambridge, from an elementary school level, has their own school board still, even as of today. Um, the Acts 46 pieces, I won't even dare to answer too many questions on because some of the folks in Montpelier don't really know what's going on with it either. I hate to say it that way, but it's kind of the way it is. Um, 
I wanted to bring up three points to you as we go. As the students leave this school and head up to the middle school and high school, they're starting a proficiency-based um, reporting system. The system that we're all used to with the A, Bs, and Cs, and Fs, and all that stuff for failure and the rest of that is starting to move away to where you get students that go up there. I visited the tech center maybe a week ago and sat down with them. They've got some folks in there that are sophomores that are basically computer whizzes. Um, I told them what I did for a living and dumping phones and the rest of that stuff for the government. And they were starting to tell me what could happen with an iPhone 10. And quite honestly, Apple will flatly deny that for you. So we've got some really smart kids that are going up through. Some of them may not be wizards at history. So they're working towards getting to the place where they're, they pass a minimum standard from the state but they're strong points. They're able to exploit those, working with their teachers and guidance folks, so that when they come out of there and they're not held back, for instance, in history, and pushed forward in a, or brought up to a certain level in math, they get a chance to go and, and write a plan with their teachers and guidance folks so that it exploits their talents to the fullest, and we go from there. I've answered a number of questions locally as far as with the Act 46, there's a perception that as voters, we've got bond money, for instance. Um, and people have said, OK, is that now community property within all the communities? No, it's not. We've, um, we've got our principal over here, Dave Manny, who can kind of attest. He's, um, we had a heating issue here a few years ago. Got brought to my attention rather vividly. So we took some of that bond money, found out what the real problem was within the heating system in the school spent that money directly here in Johnson. There's probably about $25,000 left in that fund from that bond, and that money will be spent right here. It's our tax money. We're going to be able to spend it here. I guess probably the last thing, it probably has a little bit of echo to a lot of the conversations we've had today. A lot of you remember a number of the school shootings that went on across the United States for various reasons. As a board, we got together and started spending some money, not only within the elementary schools, but namely up in the high school. Um, so that you have to have an ID badge once a certain hour goes, the doors close, and you have to have an ID badge to get in. It's kind of a token way to start things off because it's a rather, as I told several people with my background and what I know, it would get rather expensive to stop everything. So those are the issues that I thought I would bring up to you folks. Um, I'm here because everybody else is in Florida, kind of a nice place to be. So um, I have a great time serving the town of Johnson. You folks put me in this seat. I'll be here for another two years. And um, I have a great time with it. I welcome, totally welcome your comments and concerns. I know a number of folks I've seen in the room have showed up in um, school board meetings. We were going over the budget. They expressed their concerns. We took care of the business we had to. I appreciate that, and so does the rest of the board. So, any questions I can? Sure. Beth Foy, but you all know me by now. <laughs> um, so, two questions. One is um, it's hard for us to know when, if we have a topic we want to bring to the school board, when the appropriate time to bring it is. And I think often it's not in front of the whole board, it's subcommittees. Mm -hmm. So, just a quest, request for more visibility of that. Um, second is I've heard rumblings that there is potentially going to be a bond put out for the high school floor and um, potentially digging in a lot of big work. Um, when are we, you know, when should we look for that in terms of informational meetings, just generally speaking? First question, um, if you have any questions or comments that you want to have come forward to the board, my email address is on the, web, on the website. You give the information to me, and it'll become a direct line into what we're doing. So I get the opportunity to go to the meetings, and I have a little bit of pull on occasions, and I use it. So as far as the gym floor and that bond, I can tell you that I've been the one that's um, kind of been pushing at it a little bit. When I first joined the Lamoille Union Board, maybe four years ago before Act 46 came about, there was a price tag of about $500,000 to go in, redo the floor, tear it all up, get rid of all the asphalt that was in it. 
redo the bleachers that were about, I think they're going on 60 years old. Some of you folks have more history with that gym floor than I do, but it's been around for a long time. So about four years ago, the price tag was about five, dollars $600,000 to do a complete job and do it right with all the state regulations folded in. Right now, they're looking at about a million and a half, million and three quarter, almost $2 million to do the same job. So I have a wife in the banking industry, and I also spend a lot of time watching business news rather than regular news. Interest rates are pretty low right now. So my suggestion going forward to the board was, is sooner or later, we're going to pay for this. And if we kick the can down the road a few more years, that same job might be two or $3 million, and the interest rates might be above 2.5% that they're floating at now for a bond. So that, I don't know when those informational meetings will happen. I was on the budget committee, put the budget that you folks are voting on out there. Um, we decided to push it off to get the best price we possibly could. Um, your other representatives that you have from the school board that come from Johnson, some of them are rather penny pinchers, probably worse than I am. And um, so we, so they represent you folks rather well is what I'm trying to say. So the bottom line is we decided let the budget that we have here, let that be voted on and see what happens with that. And then take a look at a bond issue if we decided to, because that becomes a much bigger picture. That's where the Act 46 piece that gets spread out over more people. So that's where that is. I don't know when those, I do not know when those meetings will happen, but they'll be coming up. Oh, I'm Mark Nielsen. I live up on the hill. <laughs> I was going to walk down this morning, but it was a little too cold, and my granddaughter's sitting over there playing with her hair, asking me, well, Poppy, when are we leaving? So. I seem to remember uh, when we had information meetings here before, uh, you know, consolidating our district. Mm -hmm. uh, the discussion or the sales pitch that I heard from the school board uh, seemed to focus on um, how this is going to add to efficiency and uh, supposedly maybe not reduce our taxes but reduce the increase in our taxes. I heard very little um, sales pitch about what it was going to do for the education of the kids, and that disappointed me. Um, <clears throat> and then we voted to join here in Johnson, and we were privileged to um, be able to, to contribute to the new board, if I remember right, around $300,000 that we had in a reserve fund. And in addition to that, we gave them all our school property and then when I got my first tax bill after getting, um, after the new uh, union was formed, I found that my school tax had gone up 400 and something dollars. And um, I'm having trouble understanding after listening to all the sales pitches how that could have happened. Quite honestly, my taxes went up too. And um I'm kind of directly involved within the budget that we've had this last couple of years. I'm not sure exactly where all that money did go. I, I'll look into it, obviously, but things didn't go quite the way they said it was going to go. I mean, there's no two ways about that. We were, as I remember the informational meetings that we had, we were supposed to start out with a 10% tax break and work our way down 2%. We're getting the 2% this year. We did not start out at 10%. Well, I just sort of failed to realize um, any benefit to Johnson, and uh, that disappoints me some. In the, um, if you take a look at the five schools, for instance, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Johnson's budget was up about 6%, a little bit lower than that. The overall tax piece that came down that you folks are looking at up are voting on leveled out at about 3.2 percent so the rest of the areas have absorbed some of what would have been our taxes so that's the one benefit from it not to say that that's the greatest thing in the world right now um, we've realized some money from the busing pieces so I can't tell you that it's all what it was promised to be so A 
I'm Lois Fry. I'm one who has attended the recent meetings with the, with the budget and the information about um, Cambridge joining the, the group and all. And the attendance is absolutely dismal. And in part because, from what I find, people have no idea what's right. going on. Communication is just lacking. Terrible. And if you're a senior citizen like myself, you don't have kids or grandkids, there's no way of knowing what's going on. And I think it'd be really important to try to do a lot better with that. Yeah, At the annual meeting, for instance, we couldn't see who the school board members were. They were mixed up with, there were about 25 people in the room, and they were mixed up with the rest of us, as well as personnel. It just doesn't seem right. So I hope that can get changed. Yeah, we, um, we got the message loud and clear on the communications piece, because it was actually terrible. When I walked into the polling booth over there to vote on the Cambridge's merger, I was number 40 walking through. And I think the total vote was maybe 600 people total within the area. And I don't know for a fact, but I would imagine most of that came from Cambridge. Because they were lobbying very hard not to join. Well, I think there were people from, I know there were people from Johnson who yep. voted. But anyone I talked to about it didn't know what I was didn't talking know. about. Yep. So and that, that I'll take, seeing as I'm standing up here, that's my bad. So this coming year, I'm going to work on fixing that. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why I took the day off to come down here and stand in front of you to answer the questions, because I need to get more involved in what's going on right here in town. I've been sat down with David already once. Um, we're going to continue that cycle for a little bit so that I know exactly what's going on in the school building, period. Um, I've had my head stuck up in the moil for five years. But before I give up the mic, mm -hmm. I just want to say that the Historical Society appreciates everybody who bought pie, but we still have quite a bit left. And in the interest of the diehards who have stayed this long, it'll be $2 a slice instead of 3 <laughs> And we have to go. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Uh, Hi. Ed Raymond. I just wanted to tag on to a little bit of what Dean said uh, with the tax rate going up so high last year. And it is going down, not as high this year, but a little bit lower. Um, as you look into the future and the biggest savings that could possibly be saved in the district wide, it seems to me the closing of several schools are in play here. Are they looking at that, is my first question. And if so, when it would happen? Because I think it was a three year moratorium on that. Second question is um, with Cambridge, how come the vote was happened? a week in advance of this meeting, instead of happening at the same time as town meeting days. Thank you. Number one, as far as the school closings, no. Um, they've brought the issue up. It ends up being that there's got to be a time frame involved with that to go along with Act 46. You have to get that community involved in it. So to answer that question directly, that's not being looked at right now. Mm -hmm. It's been talked about, but that's about it. Um, as far as the Cambridge vote, that was, they had a 10 day, they explained it all out where it had to happen on that day because it was 10 days ahead of the town meeting. And um, so basically that date was picked out by law, not by anybody at random. That was terrible. <laughs> Heather Rodriguez for the record. Um, Mark, I just want to, I know that last winter we had um, somewhat of an issue with budgeting in relationship to the facilities. Mm -hmm. And I know that that was uh, handled and taken care of quite quickly. The Recreation Department worked with the Select Board and worked with um, Principal Manning. In re moving forward with our budgets, I understand that it's taken care of for the next year. But with these facilities and um, being open to the public, what was what was the the board's um, how was the move board going to move forward with that for the future? Will we always have access to these buildings for recreational programs? I will never use the word always. Always, okay, fair enough. <laughs> <clears throat> the 
but I think the point was vividly made by the public, if you will, in our budget meeting. And as I wrote a note to Nate af afterwards, um, as long as I'm up there, the school will be available. Okay, thank you. So. Heading for the mic, okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi, my name's Jeremy Baker, and I've just done a random comment for mm -hmm. the school board regarding curriculum in STEM field education. Um, I, I've had some life interruptions that have kind of obstructed my plans to open up a research lab. I was hoping to help Vermont develop its economy, and um, I'm a capitalist, but I prefer kind of a teaching environment, so if I had a restaurant and I had a dishwasher, and that dishwasher showed some initiative to learn something about the business, I would complement that person's ambition with opportunity. Um, if I could turn them into a manager, that would make my job even easier. With that said, um, when the Green Mountain Tech Center had their schematics prior to the new um, facility that is a well-endowed environment for kids to learn about automotive mechanics and electronics and stuff. I didn't notice, um, I did not see any like wet lab um, facility or uh, microbiology um, environment where students would work with tools that um, would be necessary to work with in a laboratory working with for genetics or for animal studies for health or um, information that would be useful to students who aspire to become nurses or a pre-med career in some sort. And if I had my laboratory, I would be looking to hire people with certain skill sets. And um, from what I understand, it's been a while since I've looked at your curriculum, um, the biology wet lab environment isn't really stressed. I'm sure it's there if I look for it. But I don't remember the schematics showing where there would be a laboratory where students would work in a lab environment becoming familiar with the tools and reagents, and et cetera. Um, and I, I have a personal project um, I'm not going to dwell on too, too deeply, but it has to do with the teaching science, both to children and adults. And as a person who myself has made cho a personal choice to learn things about mathematics, biology, uh, music, um, often these pursuits require a lot of personal time where I have to separate myself from other people to practice the instrument or to read the book or to not fall asleep reading my math books. I often drooled in quite a few math books during my school time. With that said, um, I had to develop personal strategies to deal with the stress of uh, separating myself from social engagements, um, not nurturing family relationships and, f and uh, familial and friendship relationships so that I could learn something about calculus or genetics, or microbiology, or the piano. And in the debate about how to get more women into the STEM fields, not just giving them an education, but getting them into a career where they hold their job, um, I've often tackled with the more sublime challenges. Um, um, looking into why do some of these people make the personal choice not to pursue a, a science degree. And sometimes I have to wonder if it's because working alone with abstract ideas or working in a laboratory with reagents you can't really see, with chemicals, formulas, um, if that might be a little, little too personal isolated activity for somebody who might want to be in a social environment at work. And I've wondered if in the teaching curriculum of like early access to STEM fields, like here's two plus two equals four, this is a pipette. They might also include like ideas on how to de-stress yourself or how to manage friendships with people who might hold it against you if you don't show up at their birthday party. And say, you know, you're gonna have to find friends and community members who will support you, um, how to, basically uh, aside the STEM fields like a toolkit on like how to how to deal with uh, the stress of studying 
or spending an hour every afternoon alone in a room with your guitar um, so that you can go out and be social. Um, maybe stressing some of the social aspects of science, saying, yes, you might work a lot alone in a room with your books, and then work in a lab alone a little bit with your coworkers, but you have opportunities to go out and do social things, social outreach programs, and investigative research stuff that would help with policy decision making. And my speculation is just that. I don't know if it would work, but um, I would encourage the school board to uh, a, try to get their students a little more aware about the wet, wet lab work and biology work that's out there because increasingly our energy needs are being met through genetic engineering. There's a community member in our, outside of our town who was some researchers working on trying to turn yeast into producing biofuel. Um, Computer chips are now using components made from the uh, proteins of certain cells derived from bacteria um, that power some of our planes. Um, one of the benefit of having a computer that uses proteins is that when the apparatus is damaged, it kind of destroys itself. But Composites, building materials, the genetic engineering that's happening with hemp, people who are now producing hemp that can be pressed into polymers that's going to help build buildings and structures, so on and so forth. Thank you for my time. Okay. I, I just wanted to address the gentleman who just spoke. Uh, as a teacher at the high school, I can tell you there's a lot of programs going on with the EPIC program. Tech Center programs are working really hard to get kids out of the school and doing practical projects, working on life skills, working on uh, interpersonal skills and things like that. So that, that is a movement done within the school and also by the, the law passed by the legislature that changed us from traditional grades to proficiency-based education. It deals with a lot of this stuff and it's a big culture shock to move that way um, and it's causing a lot of growing pains but it is moving in the direction that the previous speaker was suggesting that we do. That's all. Okay. Thank you very much. You might actually have a conversation with that gentleman. Um, Article 14, to transact such other businesses may be properly brought before the town meeting. Do you have something? Can I just say one thing? Uh, yes, yeah, say one thing. One thing. So at the back, we have mail back prescription drug envelopes. So if anybody knows anybody who might not be able to get out to one of the four prescription drug drop boxes to discard their medicines, pick up a box or pick up an envelope and bring it to them. Thank you. This is a this is a preferred motion. I want you to know I'm violating Robert's rules. Uh, this is just real quick, uh, Greg Stefanski again. Just wondering when we get into some of those motions where there are multiple amendments and they were calling the question, and I'm just wondering about and especially for folks who may have a challenge with hearing, um, is if there could be some monitor, and I know we have notes taken, so when we get to actual, where we're gonna take action, we could see it so that the person who's making the motion is clear, you're clear as a moderator, we're clear on what we're voting on. So just a suggestion of something to look at for next year, or beyond. White whiteboard would be fine. Yes, thank you. Okay, wait, here was the, here was the motion. And I take that motion. Is there a second? There is a second. All those in favor, not amendable, not debatable. Anyone can make a speech they would like after we've adjourned. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed, no.